Oh, ladies and gentlemen. Ah! Today is January the 2nd of 2022. And we have survived into the next year. And I'm about to hop and chat with Mr. Agent Smith and we're going to figure out what the heck is going on. Serious in this channel. Found him. Hello? I have pushed to talk on. Swear word. Hello? 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 Hey, how are you? Hello? Good, how are you? Can't complain. Yes, you can. <laughs> do you want to? No, no, I'm fine. Chat, do you want to complain? Chat, just complain about one thing in your life right now, if you need to. Happy New Year, dude. Happy New Year. Did you have a decent Christmas and New Year's Eve? Oh, yeah. Everything went according to plan. Did the cops show up? No, that was not part of the plan. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he didn't party too hard then. I'm glad no. you're staying safe. No, I just uh, played Shadow Empires. That was probably the big thing that I've been doing. Nice. I watch some interesting documentaries on Afghanistan run by the Taliban now. Oh, cool. Which one did you watch? There were two of them, I think, that were reported on by f French journalists. can't remember exactly which uh, documentaries they were, but it was basically going around and talking to different people in the administration now and kind of their take on stuff. Uh, please stop putting sanctions on us. We need aid. <laughs> kind of a thing and yeah. then talking about the new uh sharia law system it's a system that most all governments don't use but it's one that was like a, a very like og uh, muslim kind of system of justice where it's more uh, top down from the religious leaders decisions rather than through a court system that's held separate from the church like we have in most countries and it has some upsides and downsides. They were saying the upside is you do get your issues addressed way faster because there are way fewer steps in the chain. It's like a room full of people and there's some judge. He's just sitting in the middle of the room and they're, everyone's in a line. And when it's their turn, they basically tell them what the situation is. And then this guy makes a ruling on it and then they move along. So super fast system. Obviously that means that you can't do as much diligence of like evidence collection and getting accounts from other people and stuff. It's like rapid fire justice. And then the other thing that was really surreal and different from anything I've seen before is they basically just yeeted women from a whole bunch of different jobs and opportunities and stuff. Like women can't get an education unless it's specifically for nursing. So all the women who are like enrolled in university or middle school or high school or whatever, it's either, okay, you're a nurse now or you just don't get education. And in addition, when they're like walking around on the streets and stuff, they're not supposed to look any direction other than forward because I don't know, you're supposed to just be silent and not dilly dally or whatever. And you also have to have pretty major head and body coverings and so on so there are a lot of groups and stuff of women who are trying to protest this and saying give us our rights back that kind of a thing and that's why i would guess a lot of people were clamoring to leave that's a very major societal shift in just how lifestyle works especially for women yeah. so i could see why they would want to get the heck out and it's also why uh, <laughs> other countries aren't really chomping at the bit to like honor them as a sovereign state and stuff. If they're doing that, uh, even conservative countries, like comparatively conservative countries wouldn't go that far. That's just like turning back women's rights 200 years, 300 years, maybe more than that. Well, for Afghanistan, kind of more goes back to the nineties. <laughs> yeah. But for say a, a European nation oh, or yeah. something that's like going back to the 1400s or some crap yeah it's been a while and uh Although, 
another key item we can kind of break these down one by one after the other one was the opium market and opium farming and how that's basically the cash crop there because it doesn't require as much water as other crops so if you want the most bang for your buck and you're a farmer you farm opium because any other crop you're not going to get as much money for it and it requires more irrigation and afghanistan it's not the wettest place in the world so they can't really be super picky it seems like the taliban wants no drugs but also they can't have their society completely collapse so that's like one of the last remaining markets that has a lot of revenue going through it so they're kind of just letting them do their thing and like turning a blind eye it seems like what the afghan authorities are yes uh, stands to reason it's probably uh their biggest single source of tax revenue at this point i would guess mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah it's uh it's quite the mess and it it's all happening during a drought so there's a major shortage of food mm -hmm. so it's going to be ugly for a while i suspect but yeah them becoming more them implementing more conservative rules was fairly predictable i think everybody was kind of expecting that to one degree or another i think the only reason it took as long as it did is because they were hoping that they could uh trade it for financial aid basically but that doesn't seem to be forthcoming what do you mean like they could not have as conservative a rule set and then get aid correct so they this is kind of like guessing them doing a mind game but they could clamp down with hyper conservative rules and then negotiate loosening them up to a point where they might have been fine with that anyway but then they get aid yeah yeah, that was kind of the idea. Hmm. Hypothetically, they could still do that. It's just uh, going to depend on how engaged uh, the developed world wants to be with them. They would need to change it a lot. <laughs> a lot. Well, it just depends. I mean, uh, on the one hand, you could ask for a lot of change if you're a Western country considering extending recognition and aid. Hmm. Uh, but on the other hand, you're more likely to have such requests rejected. Mm -hmm. In which case, you know, they don't get the aid, but then you don't get any change and the women aren't getting helped. So it might be more effective to ask for a little less, uh, such that it's more likely to be accepted on the part of the Afghan government. In which case, you know, you're not really uh, helping them as much as you might like, but they are at least getting some help, you know, some relief. Uh, from the draconian regime that they're living under. <clears throat> they also so wielded different... back to the Sharia law punishments too. Like you steal, you steal stuff, your hand gets chopped off. Oh yeah. It's probably not entirely unpopular depending on where you live. I think I remember reading too that there's a fair amount of regional variance in terms of implementation. So I'd, I think I'd remembered reading that in the, some of the cities in the West, like uh, Herat, there had been less uh, strict implementation of the rules regarding women's education. Mm -hmm. and that may also be true for other large urban areas as well, but I haven't really followed it closely. I just kind of assumed from the start that they were going to go back to how they were in the 90s. Yeah, it does vary because there was a... A news reporter lady who was kind of talking about her experience of getting to work and such and she obviously still has a job if she's going to work so it's it's not a hundred percent women don't have any jobs anymore but that's kind of the big picture thing they were wanting to go for is they believe in this regime that women do not belong in the workforce unless it's specifically for nursing or something so mm -hmm. people either have to be in the more progressive part of Afghanistan and have already had some job that is basically just still actively running or they hard switch into nursing or they're doing it kind of clandestine under the, like they have to be sneaky about it. Could be one way. I know there was a lot of underground, uh, what would you call them? Tutors, I guess. Underground tutors for girls 
mm -hmm. uh, circulated back in the 90s. They could probably do something similar again. Probably be easier now since you could do uh, do it over the internet, basically. True. It's so surreal, like from a, a country where we have public education and it's required. As a kid growing up, you have so many of those mornings where it's like, oh, I don't want to go to school today. Like, I mean, going to school, it's boring. I don't want to do that. But in some places, like, it's not even an option on the table. And kids who they're kind of being dragged out of bed to go to school, they don't really realize the opportunity that they have that some people don't have. Yeah. Yeah, it's not a given. It's very much the result of a very particular moment in history and a certain degree of economic development. Not everybody has that. <clears throat> Yeah, I guess one could counter, could provide the counter argument that the uh, surreal thing is not so much the lack of education, because you can, you know, you can kind of see a lack of extensive public education in a multitude of uh, undeveloped nations. It's not necessarily all that uncommon in the grand scheme of things. Uh, what is perhaps more unusual is that uh, the United States in conjunction with a, a number of the wealthiest nations in the world tried to create such a system in one of the most poor backwards nations on the planet and did so uh, for 20 years. It's a kind of a wild experiment if you frame it like that. Mixed results, suffice to say, and it was always something of a bubble given the lack of political will to kind of stick it out permanently. Uh, unfortunate for the people who grew up in that bubble, whom never thought that it would uh, disappear, but that's yeah, so kind of what happened. There were, I guess you're saying there were more education opportunities, say contrasting with this Taliban rule, uh, more education opportunities for women when the U.S. rolled through. They kind of established some infrastructure when they're there, and they're like, hey, this is how it's meant to be done, use this. And that generation of people got to benefit from that, and then it's been reverted. Yeah, yeah, that's the that's the weird thing. Like, if the United States had rolled in and done that over the course of, like, five years and then left, mm -hmm. it would not have really impacted people's expectations that much because probably it would have reversed pretty soon afterwards. Mm -hmm. So nobody would have been disappointed, per se, because it would have only been five years. But we were there for 20. So there was a whole generation of people who grew up under that system, and there was an expectation set that future generations would, too. And, uh, you know, we can kind of look back and label that as being naive. We could say that it was never really going to last, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, to a certain degree, that's uh, backseat driving with the benefit of hindsight, you know, that kind of thing. Hmm. Uh, you know, looking back, there was definitely, regardless of how inevitable failure was, there was a lot of people who genuinely thought that bubble was going to last. And so having been there for 20 years, you know, which again was a, much longer commitment than anybody expected when the war started. It's uh, kind of amazing that such a large bubble was allowed to emerge in the first place. That was kind of a, the result of a massive influx in resources over the course of two decades. <clears throat> you know, we were, you know, the war in Afghanistan, to put it another way, can be said to be so extent, could said to be so expensive as to have created a whole alternate reality within Afghanistan where there was a substantive liberal developed future possible. Mm -hmm. And you mean classical liberalism, not yeah. what the Democrats envisioned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, a little bit different. But yeah, that's, uh, that's just the world bending power of all the hundreds and billions of dollars that were spent in Afghanistan and uh, the weight of the US military along with aligned militaries that were deployed there. You know, we were able not only to fight the Taliban and create a public education system and something resembling a democratic state, although with a lot of flaws, but we influenced expectations. That's kind of the wildest thing. Expectations don't generally move that easily. So to have long-term expectations shift like that on a national level, you know, all over the country, and then to just change it overnight, that's pretty extreme. You don't see that a whole lot in history.
So I think that's kind of where Afghanistan is right now. I think a lot of people are still kind of adjusting to the dramatic, you know, the dramatic nature of the change. You know, it's just been so sudden and such a complete reversal in so short a time. I suspect a lot of people are really having trouble even believing it even now. So it's not entirely clear what the final equilibrium is going to look like. I think it's going to take a while for, you know, not only the people the Taliban conquered, but also the Taliban themselves. It's going to take all of them a while to kind of adjust to the new normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Taliban were totally unprepared for governing large cities, especially Kabul. That Kabul has grown significantly since they were last in power in the 90s. So they're not at all ready for that. There was something that was said similar to it with uh, it wasn't Trump. Who is the guy from some northwestern state who was a senator or something? Paul Ryan? Is that the guy? Paul Ryan was a uh, I think he was the GOP speaker of the house for a long yes, time. Yes, I think that was years. him. He made some comment about how it's harder to be a a majority party than an opposition party because governing is hard <laughs> which is true it's definitely easier to be the complaint box of being like you can't do that it's bad than to actually make something that has enough compromises that both sides agree on it and they're willing to kind of move forward with something mm. across party lines very mm. difficult to do regardless of where you're doing that from yeah unfortunately so you know here in the united states we're fortunate to have a relatively stable political culture such that there's a norm in place where we try to settle those kinds of differences peacefully there's a lot of countries that uh, still do it violently they're the worst for it it's a difficult norm to uh get in place mm -hmm. you kind of have to get everybody in the country to recognize it and respect it and if a large enough portion of the population doesn't want to then you basically just can't then you have a whole new set of problems yeah you mentioned european corollaries to afghanistan under the taliban and uh i thought of uh spain under general franco after he won the spanish civil war in the 1930s uh, his government was very conservative, and it wasn't as conservative as the Taliban, but uh, they definitely did things differently than the rest of Europe. And I think I remember reading uh, that if you were not married, that is to say, well, if you were a woman, you couldn't vote at all. You know, it was restricted to men. Mm -hmm. uh, but even if you were a man, if you were not married, you still you couldn't vote. Huh. You, know, you would ha you would basically have to be married and have a family in order to be able to vote in elections. <clears throat> you know, little things like that, basically. That's the one that comes to mind, but I'm sure there's others. Maybe we've got some people from Spain listening who can provide some other examples. But uh, yeah, there was a lot of uh, very conservative policies like that that were implemented at that time. I don't know for sure, but I suspect also that he probably gave big chunks of public education uh, that is to say responsibility i suspect he also gave responsibility for public education to the catholic church because that was one of the things uh conservatives in spain had uh kind of been fighting against the republicans over the republicans in spain uh wanted to have public education be entirely controlled by the state and they wanted to remove uh, religious institutions from it almost entirely and so having lost the civil war then obviously the conservatives went in the opposite direction but that's not a subject I've read a whole lot about. I just know that it was a part of the debate. Yeah, religious institutions historically have been generally responsible for education in many societies, not only in Europe, but you know, in Asia and Africa as well. Uh, you know, in Asia's case, it was more like you know Hindu temples or uh, Confucian temples or what have you, but uh, there generally wasn't a whole lot of public education per se. Mm -hmm. Probably India came the closest. I understand that uh, 
European public education as an idea was kind of borrowed from public education in India. But in India's case, I don't think it was state education. I think it was just sort of broad based religious education. But because the Catholic Church was sort of the, you know, the temple, so to speak, in the context of European civilization, they were generally responsible for teaching children in a lot of parts of Europe. And uh, some of the more conservative hardliners in Europe who disagreed with, uh, you know, the nascent liberalism that was emergent in the early 20th, well, not 20, in the early 19th century in Europe, generally disagreed about uh, the role that the state should be allowed to play in religious education for conservatives. They believed it should that it would be better if it remained in the hands of uh, the Catholic priesthood. Well, maybe not the priesthood, but uh, the Catholic Church in general. I think it was mostly nuns that actually did the teaching. Everybody I've ever known who went to Catholic school complains about the nuns. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think it is the nuns that actually do most of the teaching. But yeah, that's just an example of a rough European corollary to uh, conservative policy making in Afghanistan. You know, it's not exactly the same. They were never as bad as Afghanistan, but uh, there have there is at least one example there of a country kind of uh, basing their policy on conservative ideals rather than liberal ideals. Conservative within the context of European politics. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to hear about uh, Afghanistan like that. I hadn't, I haven't been following it too closely since the war ended. So, but hearing you talk about the documentaries kind of makes me curious again. Yeah, it. I don't know. It seems more interesting than I expected because of the aspect you were talking about of the bubble created by the U.S. rolling in and a temporary window where people got to enjoy a lot of the privileges and benefits of having a liberal society where everyone can get an education and all that kind of stuff. It's not just like a, oh, yay, the Taliban won, and that's what we wanted the whole time. This is great. Absolute win. There were a lot of people who were not happy with that and the changes that come with it. The mm -hmm. argument from the Taliban whenever they're getting interviewed by this journalist and stuff was that, oh, I know these people, they were killed by U.S. airstrikes and stuff, and that's kind of their narrative is we're the heroes who saved Afghanistan from the tyrants who came in and killed a bunch of people, which it's true. Like it, it's war and a bunch of people died and many of those people were civilians and uh, not combatants. So in that sense, there are going to be some people who will see them as the heroes. But if you're a, a woman looking to get an education, it's a loss rather than a win. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things I learned in uh, grad school from a sociologist was that in every society, there's always people who are dissenters, people who are not satisfied with the uh, status quo, even if that status quo is defined by cultural traditions that have been a part of the society for generations and generations. You know, no matter how stable a society looks, there are always people who are unhappy with it to some degree. So, you know, during the time of uh, U.S. intervention in Afghanistan, that was obviously, you know, the conservatives, uh, you know, in the form of the Taliban and some of their like minded people. But then now that the Taliban is in control, there's probably going to be a similar dissatisfaction amongst uh, the more urban population in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. What that means as far as stability is an open question. You know, I don't know really what they can do. I mean, there's been some protests, but protests are really only effective. Well, not only effective, but they're the most effective in liberal societies that allow some scope for freedom of speech. Uh, they tend to be less impactful in more closed societies. So I don't know how responsive the Taliban are going to be to protests. They've already, you know, just opened fire on some of them. So that's not really a good sign there as far as uh, their willingness to give concessions. But we'll see, you know, like I said, they don't really know how to run cities 
And they've been basically begging, you know, bureaucrats from the former regime that they overthrew to come back and help them govern. I don't know how many takers they're going to get, but they do have at least some. I find it borderline hilarious in a kind of sad, tragic way that uh, Hamid Karzai is actually just kind of living in Kabul now. Did you know this? No. Like uh, Hamid, Kamar Hamid Karzai was the, pres the first president of the uh, Islamic Republic of Afghanistan that the United States created mm -hmm. after it invaded in 2001. So he was president for like the first eight years, nine years, you know, whatever the ridiculously long presidential term limit was. And uh, he was, he's basically been proven to have been on the payroll of the CIA, mm -hmm. which is not surprising. You know, I mean, it figures the U.S. would want to uh, be involved in Afghan politics. So no great shock, but it is a little surprising that it basically became public knowledge. Uh, but even more surprising then is uh, the fact that the Taliban have been pretty chill to have a you know former paid CIA agent who was president of the country under the regime they were trying to overthrow just kind of hanging out in Kabul. They kind of have this weird detente going on. It's not at all what I would have expected. Are they fine with him? Like I would think that he would be someone they would be unhappy with having around. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's like I would have thought they would. <laughs> I would have thought they'd have killed him, but it seems not. It seems they uh, they're either weirdly chill with him or they came to some kind of arrangement. Mm -hmm. Probably the latter, if I had to guess, but I don't have any proof of that. But yeah, he's just kind of kicking it in Kabul right now. A very strange time to be alive, Nero. True. We're definitely in a period of instability and a lot of weird stuff. One of the interesting ones this year, we get the other side of the coin. So last summer we had some like 113 degree days in Seattle, which is like, what the heck? This is not our our usual summer. Like what? What do we need to get air conditioning everywhere now? And then. Uh, We've been having sub-freezing temperatures for over a week and it snowed a bunch and it was down to like, I don't know, 16 degrees here. So extremely cold, yes. Oh, wow. We're right next to the water. So even though Seattle's pretty far north, being right next to the Pacific Ocean moderates our temperature a good deal. compared with somewhere like equivalent latitude, but uh, more inland. That's called continentiality. Hmm. Well, you can keep all that cold weather. We don't need it down here. You'll probably get some weird cold spell again. <laughs> I hope not. It didn't go too well last time. It didn't. I was actually talking about that the other day because uh, we have some viewers from Texas. Broken Helix lives in Texas and he was mentioning that cold spell that y'all had, and I was like, oh yeah, who is that That senator who just offed to Cancun right when that happened? It's like, oh man, it's really cold here. What should we do? Let's leave. And then all of your constituents are <laughs> trapped in Texas. It's not the best look. No. He should have talked to someone before doing that, I think. Yeah, I'm inclined to agree. It wasn't the most uh, inspiring moment of his political career. <laughs> when you think of which politician do I think represents me and who do I want to follow into the field of battle, Ted Cruz, he's not super high on the list after doing that. Yeah, I'm sure he'll I'm sure his core supporters will still love him. Yeah. But I don't I don't know how popular he still is cuz I think like the height of his popularity was back during the Tea Party movement. Yeah, back under the Obama administration, because you could really tell that he was posturing for a uh, presidential run, you know, basically throughout the Obama administration. Mm. He really wasn't very subtle about it. And, uh, he, you know, him and his machinations were one of the big reasons that there was so much uh, discord in the uh, Republican caucus in the Senate, if not also the House. So there was a great deal of upheaval at that time. And uh, some of his ambitions were definitely one of the major contributing factors, which made it all the more ironic then when, you know, after going out of a way, going out of his way to pose as sort of this uh, right wing lodestar 
of the American conservative movement that he ends up getting primaried <laughs> by Donald Trump, who just kind of swings in and paints himself as being even more conservative and even more radical and even more of an ideologue. Yeah, the the stance of appearing like an outsider seems to be a pretty big edge because of the satisfaction with like current politicians while being involved in politics informs you about how to win and improves your power network say like a hillary clinton uh, the general public kind of sees uh, representatives as being kind of lazy where if there's a government shutdown a lot of other people who have more physically demanding jobs still have to work but they get a day off so yeah image goes a really long way and one thing that i've talked about regarding streamers is the difference between the streamers like on camera persona and how they would conduct themselves just with their friends off camera and you could more or less like plot the distance for each person it would be kind of a a fuzzy social piece of data but um, you could still say all right for this person are they actually like this day to day when the camera isn't on or are they pretty different from that I think I'm mostly the same. I would concur from what I remember. It's been a while since we've actually hung out in person. Yeah. But yeah, yeah I, from what I remember, pretty much the same. One thing that I do less when I'm not on stream is occupy as much space in the conversation if you talk like a streamer in a group setting of like five people or so, it's pretty obnoxious. <laughs> so I try to listen more. And well, that's always a pretty good idea in general when you're in large groups like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes the distribution of personalities kind of is just conducive to it. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you have a bunch of shy people and then maybe one sort of extrovert so then naturally they just kind of dominate the conversation but yeah in general it's kind of better to take a back seat in larger groups just kind of allow the conversation to flow organically and just kind of follow it where it goes you know what i did Nero? hmm i was in the uh I was in the shed behind the house trying to help put up some Christmas stuff, and I remembered that I had some books in there, and I finally dug some out, including some on uh, the Soviet Union in World War II that I'd been looking for for like two years as part of research for that Eastern Front thing that I keep putting off interminably. Mm -hmm. So I've got that finally. Hopefully I can take some good notes on that. There's a couple stories and chapters in there in particular that I think would be good for it because I know everybody keeps saying uh well not everybody but when we did the Pacific a couple years ago the principal feedback was uh human stories mm -hmm. people sort of like things to be humanized at a sort of individual level so there's some good stories in some of those books I found that should be able to kind of give some color nice to the campaign stuff yeah, that's something I've really noticed as a major difference between how different articles are structured is sometimes it, it reads more like a textbook where they're just like, this is when it happened. This is what happened. These are the numbers about the casualties and all this, the equipment and so on. And then you'll have other ones that start. It was late in the night and I wasn't sure what was going to happen. And they kind of pitch it more as a an individual's perspective in the story. And some people prefer one over the other. I think I generally prefer just give me the TLDR of what happened, but that might just be an attention span thing. I like the data. Sometimes if I'm getting into a review or a critique of a movie or something and they do that whole story form thing, I'm like, come on, just get, <laughs> get to what it is. I don't need to hear about your day as well. <laughs> what happened here? Yeah, getting to the point is, uh, it can be a nice. Yeah. yeah, I would agree. It's uh... But from a historical standpoint, there's a difference here in that the world was different back then. Just the different 
ways that people communicated. Maybe you wrote physical letters when you're a military person out in the field instead of sending an email. Like all of that stuff adds a lot of perspective to what life was like, as opposed to say a, a modern restaurant critique or something. Like you can go there and it's going to be the same experience for you. Yeah, context is important. Mm -hmm. And people kind of forget that. Well, they don't forget it per se, but you know, it's over the breadth of time, you know, newer generations just don't remember. So they kind of lose the original context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the first, I think, chapter, I guess, of notes I did for the Eastern Front thing that I was planning and am technically still planning pretty much was just providing context, you know, sort of the lead up to the conflict and, uh, sort of illustrating where the respective combatants were in terms of their economic development and political development and whatnot. Combatants. Combatants, thank you. We had so many people <clears throat> ask about you these past couple weeks. We didn't do one last week because of holiday, but holy smokes, I had to make up a when is Agent Smith command? Because they're like, hey, is Agent Smith coming on today? And it's like, I don't know. I text him like an hour before we start. But I appreciate your interest. Hey, just tuning in. Big fan of Agent Smith. Uh, when's he going to be on? It's like, oh, for Pete's sake. We're going to make a command now. So there's a command, ladies and gentlemen. Agent Smith, when? If you see someone who's curious about when Agent Smith is coming on, there's details there about his usual appearance, which we're fairly consistent at this point. It's like yeah, ballpark, it so. of, ballpark of 6 p.m., Pacific time, plus or minus an hour. Do we have any Russians listening? Always at least a few. Yeah, I don't know. We don't have any flags for Russia. Oh, you think they don't VPN? Come on. <laughs> we got any Russians in the chat? <laughs> Well, I don't think the Russian internet is all that closed off. I think people can still stream on Twitch, surely. Yeah, they can. But VPNs are cool. Oh, so... Gunning for a sponsorship? No. <laughs> Today's stream is sponsored by NordVPN. No, not really. Uh, Where's see. Inmate? Yeah. Sorry, what? We have a Dota 2. He's like a pro caster in the Dota 2 scene, and he's Russian. Huh. He raids into our channel sometimes. So you could tune into a neuro stream and we have 300 Russian speakers or zero, depending on inmate. Yeah, I'm not seeing them. That's too bad. I was going to ask uh, some Russia questions to chat. But I guess I'll have to aver. You can still ask and they can <clears throat> answer in comments too for YouTube. Oh, yeah, that's true. Could be worth it. <laughs> Why? What's going on in Russia that you wanted to ask about? Uh, actually, it didn't have to do with current events. It had to do with regions. Mm. You know, as a, you know, I can tell by the books that I got in my shed. I used to be really into Russia. I used to like to study it a lot when I was in high school. But uh, at that time, we didn't have, like, Wikipedia and the Internet. Well, at least not like we have them now. And so one of the things I had a really hard time finding information about was uh, the cultural identities of different Russian regions, uh, or even just Russian region regions in general. Because in the West, we don't really think in terms of differences in Russian regions. You know, I think in the West, we know about like um, Moscow, St. Petersburg, Siberia, and that's about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we don't, we're not really that familiar with the uh, internal differences within Russia. And that was kind of one of the things I'd always wanted to read more about. I was able to pick up like bits and pieces of information from different sources over time, but I was never able to like sit down in Russian and just ask them like, how do you view different regions of Russia? <clears throat> so that could be a fun thing uh, to learn about if possible using the uh, modern wonder of mass communication. I know a couple of regions, like I know, um, like the Volga, for example, is a distinctive region, especially the lower Volga, and then the Kuban and the Northern Caucasus, and then uh, Donbass, 
which sort of straddles eastern Ukraine and southwestern Russia. And then there's sort of the Russian core region, sort of in and around Moscow. If you look at a population density map, you can kind of see that there's like a really dense patch of population sort of in the middle of Western Russia. And that's kind of where a good chunk of the population is. Not a majority, mind you, but it's disproportionately large compared to other areas. And then, of course, there's like uh, the Ural Mountain region, which I think has more people in the southern part. And then there's the Black Earth region through Siberia, where most of the population there lives. And there was like that weird industrialized region way out east. I was trying to remember the name of that today. What was that? Is that the one that's super cold? Well, it's, it's all pretty cold. <laughs> yes, that's Russia. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's pretty cold. Oh, what am I thinking? I want to say it's Novokuznetsk. Southwestern Siberia. Yeah, that sounds right. I'm trying to look it up on... Well, no, that's not east enough, though. Well, anyway. Yeah, there was like a somewhat industrialized region out in Siberia. I can't quite summon the name of it. And I know that uh, Novos Novosibirsk, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, is kind of known for being a university city. And Omsk was originally the largest city in Siberia, but then the Soviets kind of shifted focus to Novosibirsk. So now it's kind of more uh, the center. Omsk is still important, but more so Novosibirsk. And uh, then there's like Cheetah, way out on like the border with China. And then there's the Russian Far East, which is kind of more where Vladivostok is. And then there's like all the stuff up around the Arctic Circle and up in Kamchatka and whatnot. That's sort of a, that's not very populated as you can imagine. And I know there's like a lot of uh, <clears throat> autonomous republics uh, in Russia, which are generally they generally have like the ethnic minority groups like uh, if you look up uh, what's the word if you look if you do a Google image search for Russian autonomous republics you'll probably be able to get a map and those are the areas that have the largest densities of minority groups and generally they're like ethnic Turkish peoples especially in Siberia and Eastern and uh, the European part of Russia like there's a whole gaggle of them all next to each other, sort of around uh, where the Volga River meets the Ural River. And those are like uh, Tatarstan and Tatarstan rather and Bashkoristan and, you know, some of those others there. And those are sort of uh, Turkish ethnic groups that have that have been there for a very long time. They were actually uh, independent. They were actually they'd actually originally been independent city states along the river, basically trading states. Uh, way back before Russia ever even expanded there. And actually one of the first places east of Russia that the Russians expanded into and conquered uh, back when Russia was undergoing like its first major expansionary phase in the 1500s was sort of that area where the Ural River meets the uh, Volga River. You know, these sort of uh, Tatars, basically, that they conquered and subjugated. I think the largest city there is Kazan, if I'm not mistaken which is not the kind of name you would associate with a major Russian city, but Kazan actually is, is a significant Russian city. And it still retains a considerable Tatar identity. It's not as though they were completely swamped with ethnic Russians. I think it's something like 50-50 now. Mm -hmm. Maybe somebody who knows better would uh, be able to correct me on that. Actually, I should do the usual. <laughs> Let's just do the usual disclaimer now. I'm not an expert in everything I talk about painfully obvious at times. So uh, if I ever say anything wrong, stupid, or biased, uh, Chad is encouraged to correct me. If I'm wrong, I want to know more than anybody. You know, I don't want to spread mistruths and whatnot. So uh, please do correct me. You know, I learn a lot from Chad, you know, when I read through. I don't read Chad while we do this, but I will read it after. I can't really walk and chew bubble gum at the same time, unfortunately. <laughs> but yeah, please, corrections are welcome and uh, participation is encouraged. But yeah, that said, so this particular cluster of autonomous republics northeast of Moscow are mostly Tatar, and they still retain like a lot of Tatar identity. Like a, a lot of them are still Muslims, for example, and some of the architecture kind of reflects uh, Tatar heritage. And they still speak their original language, 
I believe, if I'm not mistaken. You want some really weird trivia about the Tatars? Tatars? Yes. Actually, I'm not even sure how to pronounce it now that I think about it. That's another one of those words that I've always read but never heard said. I think it's pronounced Tatars, but please correct me if not. But yeah, as far as trivia, uh, the Tatars in Tatarstan specifically, uh, the Autonomous Republic of Tatarstan in Russia, are actually related to the population of Bulgaria. And uh, it's a very old linkage. Like they've been separated for a very long time to the point where they're fairly different cultures now. Uh, but ethnically speaking, they actually have a common origin. So like uh, originally, the people who lived in what is now Tatarstan were called Bulgars. And uh, what happened is a sort of segment of the population migrated south and then west into southern Europe. And uh, they kept the name, you know, Bulgar, but they didn't really keep much else. You know, they changed their language. They kind of adopted a more Slavic culture and Slavic language. You know, basically they became modern Bulgarians, but they kind of retained the old identifier, Bulgar. Uh, now, the original Bulgars, the old Bulgars up in, uh, you know, the Ural River, they ended up retaining the language, retaining sort of the culture, but they ended up changing the name because they were influenced by uh, Mongols, which kind of blew in and influenced the culture, as well as sort of other influences. So they became known as Tatars instead of Bulgars, and uh, they've kind of kept the identifier ever since. Hmm. <clears throat> So yeah, it's a, it's a pretty neat area. You know, when people talk about Russia and Russian culture, they almost always focus on, you know, Moscow or St. Petersburg or uh, maybe Siberia, you know, because Siberia kind of has an identity unto itself outside Russia. But, you know, people don't really talk about the autonomous republics that much. They're kind of invisible to the Western imagination, I feel. Yeah, there's the a, majority of the population is concentrated around Moscow, right? At least that's the biggest chunk that's the most densely populated part but yeah. uh i would say more like european russia in general has like two-thirds of the population something like that mm -hmm. siberia which is again the entire region east of the ural mountains only has like uh 40 million people it's not much you know it's probably around the population of california at this point uh, to give a comparison, though, like the West in the U.S. is very sparsely populated compared to the East. If you're looking at states like Utah and Nevada and yeah. Wyoming and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think a better comparison with Siberia, as far as America goes, would probably be Canada. Canada is basically America's Siberia. There's actually some similarity in the geographic size if you combine the United States with Canada to Russia. In fact, I think it might even have been comparable to the Soviet Union back when it was still intact. I don't quite remember. I was running the numbers like a couple of years ago because I was curious. <clears throat> but yeah, if you combine Canada and the U.S. together, you end up with something that is kind of more comparable, you know, to the to either Russia or the Soviet Union, depending. But yeah, Tatarstan is really interesting. You know, the autonomous republics up there northeast of Moscow kind of are underserved, I think. And then uh, there's also a whole gaggle of them in the Caucasus. But, you know, that kind of goes without saying, you know, the frontier regions are kind of more where you would expect to have autonomous republics like that with different ethnic groups and whatnot. You know, so in the Caucasus, you would expect to see lots of Caucasian autonomous republics and uh, sort of in Siberia, you would expect to see more. But the surprising thing for me anyway, is that there's a whole bunch sort of in the middle of Russia and in the interior there. Those would be the ones around Tatarstan. That's kind of surprised me when I first learned about them. I just would have assumed that they would have been assimilated by now into the broader Russian culture, because again, they were conquered in like uh, the 1500s, but you know, they're still kind of around, mm -hmm. impressively so. Yeah, one of my little projects, um, well, I mean, one of my projects in general has been to try to kind of learn about regions such that I can kind of characterize them from different perspectives. 
And so, you know, even what I'm talking about, you know, trying to learn regional identities in Russia is kind of part of that same project, or maybe I should say hobby at this point. And one of the things I was thinking about is how people in Russia view people from the Caucasus. And I was watching a YouTube channel. Um, it's not a Russian YouTube channel, but it is a Russian YouTuber, I guess. I'm not quite, I'm not quite sure what the correct char characterization is there. Um, but, you know, he was a Russian guy who liked to talk about Russia. You know, there's, there's a couple channels like that from, you know, different countries where people just talk about their country. And uh, he made the point that there was some discrimination in Russia against people from the Caucasus, as well as people from Central Asia. And that kind of got me thinking about whether or not people in Russia look at people from the Caucasus in the same way that people from the West look at people from Russia. <clears throat> you know, somebody with the answer to that question, you know, please do let, let us know. I'm quite curious. But yeah, the Caucasus is pretty rough and tumble. You know, that's where Chechnya is. That's where Dagestan is. Uh, that's where Ossetia is. And I don't know how many people remember the war in Georgia back in 2008, but uh, one of the little breakaway statelets that was trying to declare independence from Georgia that uh, Russia intervened on behalf of was uh, south of Ossetia. And so that's technically an independent state, you know, if you're Russian, if you're not Russian, then it's sort of a breakaway province. But regardless of how you want to characterize that, uh, South Ossetia is sort of the Georgian corollary for North Ossetia, which is an actual part of Russia, an actual territory there. I don't quite remember if it was an autonomous republic, but they do have like, they are ethnically Ossetian. And uh, yeah, they just kind of ended up separated by dint of history, you know, just historical accident, one in Georgia, one in Russia. Uh, but technically, there is sort of a connection there between the two. So they saw some conflict basically in 2008. And then uh, I guess it's a little dated, but in the Kuban, sort of in the northern part of the Caucasus, there was a considerable, considerable amount of violence in the Russian Civil War. And then also uh, a consider about, considerable amount of violence during the de Kulakization campaign in the early Soviet Union and the de Cossackization period, uh, campaign rather, also in the early Soviet period. Uh, you know, there were lots of Cossacks basically in that particular area, the Kuban and the Donbass, the Eastern Ukraine. That was sort of their principal stomping ground. I guess also Siberia. Most of Siberia was originally settled by Cossacks, but. I see Tatarstan. <clears throat> I pulled up a map. Oh. This is looks like it's the regions. Oh yeah, these are provinces. Yeah. They don't distinguish them based on type though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's oblasts, which are like the basic type of province. Mm -hmm. And then there's Krays, which or Krays, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but basically those are like territories. Mm -hmm. Kind of like with um unorganized American territories before they became states back in the 1800s, like Nevada Territory or Nebraska Territory. Mm -hmm. Basically, those are kind of like what Krays are. They're more or less directly governed from Moscow and have less discretion than oblasts do. Mm -hmm. And then there's autonomous republics, which are basically states within a state, although they have less discretion than they used to. But uh, technically, they have the most discretionary power of any political entity within Russia. So there are these Altai and Tuva republics in the south? Altai and Tuva are two republics here down kind of oh, south yeah. central. Tuva's fun. What's yeah, Tuva? Tuva, Tuva, I think, used to be, it was either part of Mongolia originally or it was just an independent state. I don't know enough of the history to know which, but the Soviets forcibly annexed it in the 1920s or 30s, you know, basically early 20th century. And uh, the native ethnic population of Tuvans has kind of been butthurt about it ever since. Mm -hmm. So, you know, of, you know, in general, if you look at the ethnic breakdown of almost all of these republics, Russians are either a majority or they're roughly 50-50. There's very few where Russians do not have a significant demographic presence. Uh, you know, the ethnic... You know, the native ethnic groups sometimes still uh, represent a large part of the demography and frequently have done pretty well in preserving their culture. Uh, but <clears throat> there's not really any that are purely one or the other ethnic group. You know, generally Russians are 
very much a part of the demographic landscape. But Tuva is the exception. Tuva, I believe, only has a relatively small minority of its population that is ethnically Russian. And from what I've read, there's some discrimination, well, maybe not discrimination, maybe that's not the right word, but uh, relations between Tuvans and ethnic Russians are not the best. There's apparently some communal tension there, from what I've read. Yeah, you can see why. Yeah. And on the west side of Russia, these are all a lot tighter regions, so I'm guessing they have greater population density over on this yeah. side here. Oh yeah, very much so. Can you see a Tumen anywhere in there? Yeah, it's kind of in the middle. It's yellow. It's uh, east of Perm. Hello, yeah, Tumen next to Omsk and Kurgan. Yeah, that's kind of like, that's almost Russia's Texas. That's like a major energy producing province. It's sort of southeast of the Ural Mountains. Using what resource? <clears throat> oil? Uh, I want to say oil. I guess it could be natural gas, but I want to say oil. That's what I'm remembering anyway. But yeah, there's a good chunk of uh, Russia's energy sector that kind of gets its energy from that province. Mm -hmm. So if you look at a map of, uh, what, would, what would you call it? Provincial GDP per capita, basically. Uh, you'll see that, you know, obviously Moscow and St. Petersburg and Western Russia generally is the highest. But then you'll see out east in Siberia, this one sort of bright spot. And uh, that's Tumen, generally. So they have a slightly elevated uh, income per capita in that particular oblast. Hmm. And you've got these autonomous Okrugs. Okrug. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm guessing these are kind of middle of the Siberian forest because these regions are really big. So yeah. population density is probably really low and also resources are probably pretty low. Yeah, honestly, I don't remember what distinguishes autonomous of Krugs from the other provinces. Mm -hmm. It's been too long since I've studied it. I want to say it's like a variety of cry, like a variety of territory that's governed directly from the government, but that has somewhat more autonomy. But I don't really know the details beyond that. Chat was mentioning the Jewish region that they were saying oh. <laughs> there aren't really even any Jewish people there anymore. Yeah, you can see it there, right? It's sort of yeah. in the seal. Yeah. Yeah, that was created. I want, gosh, was it, was it the Soviets that made that? Or was it like the tail end of uh, Tsarist Russia? I can't quite remember, but it's relatively recent. And the idea was to uh, create a province just for not only Russia's Jewish population, but also sort of for Jews in Europe and uh, elsewhere to go to as a safe haven. That's a pretty far away safe haven. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the remoteness was sort of meant to be part of the attraction. You know, there's not uh, much going on there. So people could kind of be independent, kind of like the Mormons in Utah for a long time. Right. Right? There wasn't really much governance there. So they ran away there and they were able to kind of do their own thing. So mm. uh, I think Moscow kind of had something similar in mind for this particular territory. The fact that it would have also involved people coming and developing a fairly undeveloped region of the Russian Far East was probably also a factor. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever you got to do to get people over there to try to build up your presence uh, is probably worth doing. But yeah, it didn't work out. You know, I mean, the trouble Russia has is that it has kind of a bad reputation uh, amongst Jews for obvious reasons. You know, I mean, it was kind of known historically for pogroms and all manner of uh, communal violence and religious violence and whatnot. So, you know, uh, obviously other states had that too. I don't want to single Russia out, but, you know, Russia obviously had that problem. And, uh, you know, the trouble is that when a country that has a history of abusing a particular ethnic minority comes out and says, hey, we want all of you to come concentrate yourselves in this one province in one of the countries where you have the worst histories of violence, people are going to be a little suspicious. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not an intuitive move. So there was relatively little uptake as far as uh, Jews actually moving to the uh, Jewish Autonomous Oblast. I think that's what it was called. But I think it's still there even today. Mm -hmm. It has Crimea listed on here now. Must be a pretty new map. <laughs> and you see uh, in the northern Caucasus, there's one called uh, Kalmykia. 
I think it's purple on your map here. Kamikia Northern. A little bit below where you are. It's kind of Eastern Northern Caucasus. Eastern Northern. Caucasus, yeah. Sort of down there where uh, Georgia and Armenia and Azerbaijan are. Mm. Oh, yeah, there it is. Kalmykia. Yeah, that's a fun one. So, you know, if you look south of Kalmykia, there's Chechnya, which is, of course, known for, you know, uh, Islamist separatist violence. And uh, Dagestan also has some violence similar. So it doesn't have quite as much as it doesn't have nearly as much as Chechnya, but it's been known for that. And then, of course, you know, you've got the, the Russians and sort of uh, the Kuban up in the western part of the area. So, you know, there's there's a fair amount of drama in the region. Uh, with ethnic Russians and Muslims and Caucasian peoples all sort of mixed together there. But then in Kalmykia, just randomly, there's a bunch of Buddhists. Hmm. Like if you look at a if you look at a religious map of Buddhism, you know, highlighting all the areas where Buddhists live, uh, you know, in concentrated populations, you'll see this one spot out in Europe. And that's Kalmykia. Kalmykia is the only large population of Buddhists uh, outside of East Asia. Obviously, there's a lot of Buddhists in like urban areas and like Los Angeles and, you know, other Western cities. But as far as a territory dominated by a particular Buddhist ethnic group, Kalmykia is pretty much the only one. Are they like, what kind of school of Buddhism, Tibetan, Chinese, Japanese? Are they Ooh, kind of their own thing? I'm not sure. I would have to look. Kalmykia, because I learned about that well before I learned about different schools of Buddhism. Hmm. I was just shocked there were Buddhists. <laughs> no. Yeah, Russia, overall, the dominating religion would be Orthodox Christianity. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's been making a big comeback the past 10, 15 years. And Putin's a big driving force in that, right? Because he's pretty all about it yeah i mean well it's not that he really loves it i doubt he's particularly religious himself i mean he was like a doctrinaire communist kgb agent <laughs> right so back kind of in like his youth how trump uh works with christianity yeah like, i suspect it's kind of more like that yeah so you know but how I'll... to say the words that get them hyped up and get them in your corner but you're not exactly like a a prime practitioner of the faith yeah but there's an important difference though because in the case of uh, the United States, you know, there's a lot of true believers, you know, of Christianity. But in Russia, uh, the church really took a hit during the communist period. You know, there's a lot of people that kind of kept faith and an even larger portion of the population that loosely kind of kept faith. You know, it's sort of like, yeah, I kind of believe it, but I'm not practicing, you know, sort of that kind of thing. And uh, but after the Soviet Union collapsed, there was sort of this ideological vacuum you know there wasn't really a single unifying belief or faith that kind of unified the russian people and one of the journeys that russia has been on for the past couple decades since then has been trying to kind of find something to replace that hole that was left by uh, communism and you know different things have been tried in general russia is a pretty nationalist country so you know to a degree you could say nationalism has filled that void but that's not really an ideology per se so one of the things that uh, the Russian government has done is, is it's tried to kind of return to the institutions that existed before the communists took power in Russia and tried to resurrect those as some kind of unifying force uh, that could be the glue that holds Russian society together. And so part of that program has involved trying to really reinvigorate the Russian Orthodox Church so that it can play that role or at least help play that role. So. You know, in the, the American case, there's a very large constituency of people, you know, a fairly large constituency of people who are uh, Christian voters, basically, you know, Christian fundamentalists of one sort or another. Whereas in Russia, uh, the government supporting the church is more of an aspirational move. You know, they're kind of trying to create a constituency of people who are Christian voters. Uh, there are a lot of, you know, there are a fair number of Christian voters, and they have been somewhat successful in increasing uh, the number of Orthodox Christians in Russia. But... Uh, in general, the principal constituency they've cultivated instead has been nationalists. 
you know, nationalists in Russia identify with the Orthodox Church as a major symbol of Russia and Russian culture. And in so much as it is a symbol of Russian culture, they've embraced it. But whether or not nationalists themselves are particularly Christian or practice is debatable. You know, nationalists around the world don't tend to actually adhere to a lot of the uh, ethical and moral precepts they uh, pretense to adhere to. So it's sort of a defining identity goal, I guess, where they're trying to say, well, unlike Western Europe, we are kind of driven by Orthodox Christianity. That's one of the things that distinguishes us as a people. Mm -hmm. But it's sort of a they're trying to force it rather than the people had been calling for this throughout the Soviet Union's reign. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much it. You know, it <clears throat> it doesn't help that uh, a lot of Russians kind of urbanized over the course of the Soviet Union. You know, as the country industrialized and as we've seen in the West, you know, when countries industrialize, uh, sort of traditional culture and religion tends to take a hit. They don't tend to uh, retain nearly as much uh, loyalty. You know, the United States is kind of an exception, but that's sort of another, you know, that's another conversation. Mm -hmm. In general, even in the United States, you've seen a general decline of religion. But uh, yeah, so once the Soviet Union collapsed and once communism was gone, um, there was some desire to resurrect the Orthodox Church as a major religious institution. But what they found is that, you know, not just because of communist propaganda, but also just because of urbanization, there weren't necessarily a lot of takers. Mm -hmm. Now, again, I want to reiterate there has been an increase in believers you know in general there has been a general increase in the number of people who profess orthodox christian faith in russia but it's still not really a majority so right now it's kind of more an extension of the state and more used as a symbol more than anything it's kind of similar to um greece like in greece a big part of greek national identity uh involves the orthodox church there you know, because Christianity was sort of one of the defining characteristics of the great of the Greek people historically, that uh, distinguished them from the Ottoman occupiers that they kind of struggled against for so many centuries. So over the course of the uh, emergence of Greek national identity, Christianity and the Orthodox Church kind of became integrated into that identity, such that now, I think the Greek state actually uh, helps fund the church or has some kind of has some kind of official relationship there by which they support each other. And there's also another example, um, Egypt, I think, if not also some of the other pan-Arab nationalist governments in the Middle East, they have a very similar relationship with Islam. Um, Islam doesn't really have the same organizational infrastructure as like uh, Eastern Orthodox Christianity or Catholic Christianity. They don't really have a single church per se. Um, but the religion itself, like in general, is a big part of the national identity in Egypt in particular, if not also the broader Middle East. And so pan-Arab nationalist movements in uh, the Arab world, which generally were relatively secular uh, and socialist in nature, uh, generally they still retained Islam as part of their brand, so to speak, because it was considered so important to the Arab identity. And so that was incorporated into policy making such that uh, I think now there's like a school in which uh, imams are trained in Egypt, which is actually either directly or indirectly controlled by the government. So sort of these uh, official relationships between religious institutions and states are not uncommon in territories where religion is associated with national identity. It just kind of becomes a nationalist demand to incorporate uh, religious institutions into governance to some degree. Now, this is a little different than something like uh, Germany, like with uh, the Nazis or Italy, even uh, with the fascists there. Uh, in those cases, the desire was not so much to, you know, uphold and propagate uh, traditional religious institutions. The desire was more to dominate them. You know, they didn't want to allow any alternative, uh, any alternative institutions to exist beyond the state that might influence society. So the whole idea there was to just make sure they were thoroughly under state control. You know, the Soviets did pretty much the same thing. They never completely got rid of uh, the Orthodox Church or other religions, uh, especially in Islam. 
Uh, rather, they just tried to incorporate them into religious institutions controlled by the state. China still does this. You yeah, know, so I was about this. to say, doesn't China do that? Because they do that with Christianity and Buddhism and stuff where they have state-approved church leaders. Yeah. And that's who you can choose from. You can still practice your religion. No, it's fine. Just uh, pick from our list. Okay. Yeah, the Catholic Church had a big... Uh, standoff, I guess, with the uh, Communist Party of China for a number of years over the appointment of, uh, I want to say cardinals, or maybe it was just priests. I don't quite remember the specifics. Uh, but the idea was that the party wanted to have sole power to appoint high-ranking Catholic officials in China, and the Catholic Church obviously was not interested. And so for like, I don't know, five, ten years, maybe even longer, uh, they went back and forth on this until finally, a couple of years ago, they made an agreement in which they would basically share responsibility. You know, they would uh, both agree on, uh, well, they would have to reach a consensus, basically, in order to appoint new officials. And that was to the satisfaction of both parties. But you can see then that the party is not interested at all in not having control over that. You know, they're not interested in just uh, having some other institution be able to go unmolested within China. There has to be, from the perspective of the party anyway, there has to be oversight to some degree to ensure that uh, the institution in question is adhering uh, to the precepts of the party and their party line. A little bit different than how we do in the States. Well, I understand that uh, the Mormon church over in Utah is pretty powerful. Yeah. They call it the bubble there, actually. Because a oh, lot of, they? yeah, businesses and operations and stuff are just different. Like, they, pretty much everybody closes on Sundays just because um, if there's some Mormon rule about it, then they're not going to get a whole bunch of business. So even if you're not a Mormon-run business, it just doesn't make sense for you to do stuff differently than how they're doing it there. Hmm. Interesting. And then a, a lot of the just general social values and things end up being comparatively more conservative. Yeah, I had heard that. Do you know anything about uh, how the church is used in institutions of uh, welfare? No, I don't think so. Somebody on Reddit was mentioning that uh, the state will sometimes kind of push people either discreetly or directly uh, away from state provided welfare in order to encourage the use of welfare provided by the church. Hmm. But uh, he didn't provide like sources or anything, so I don't know how accurate that is. But it sounded pretty, it sounded like an interesting topic of study. I guess since we're talking about Russia, I don't think we have any questions, do you, we? You did get a, a quick silly question. What's your favorite color and why? <clears throat> it's green, but I don't remember why. <laughs> <laughs> it's, been, it's been too long. I don't know. Maybe I liked the Green Ranger on Power Rangers when I was a kid. Yeah, I have no idea. For whatever reason, green. Okay, close enough. We did have a question from last week. So I guess I could get to that. Sure. Let's see. Somebody was reading The Search for Modern China, that uh, Beijing Palace had 10,000 eunuchs in employment at the end of the Ming Dynasty. I was wondering what was the role of eunuchs in China, historically speaking. Uh -huh. Do you know what a eunuch is? Yes. Yeah. Someone uh, born male who had their testicles removed. Correct. And uh, eunuchs were pretty common in the ancient and classical world, if not also the medieval world, because uh, they were generally used as guards and uh, palace officials and they were considered a little bit safer since you know you knew they weren't going to raid your harem and try to have sex with your women hmm. so useful in that regard 
I'm sure different societies also had different reasons for having them. I'm sure there was some culture specific region here and there. Uh, but in general, you know, it happened pretty frequently. It was not an uncommon phenomenon, not only in China, but also South Asia, the Middle East. Maybe not Europe. I don't think I've ever heard of them really in Europe, actually. But certainly the Middle East, South Asia, and uh, China. So the role of eunuchs uh, in China is basically to serve as palace officials. Mind you, this is different than government officials. Um, you know, there could be some overlap depending on circumstances, but uh, in general, the apparatus of state was one institution, and then the actual palace itself in which the emperor lived was a separate institution. And uh, the palace was basically a miniature city. I mean, I'm pretty surely most people have heard of the Forbidden City. Yeah. Uh, which is located in Beijing. And so that's a palace complex rather than just a palace, which involves not only the emperor's palace, but also uh, quarters for all of the servants, warehouses for the goods and stuff for, uh, you know, so that they could feed everybody there. And uh, also just other facilities, you know, they had a whole last opera theater uh, that they could, you know, use as well. So it was a, uh, pretty basically a miniature city you know in the middle of beijing you know it's still there if you want to see it yeah they never tore it down they actually just the government just finished renovating it a few years ago i was lucky enough to catch it in 2019 just after the renovations were completed and just before covid destroyed international travel so that was a pretty nice stroke of luck on my part but yeah it's a huge complex and uh, that's where the emperor lived. And so, you know, providing enough cooks and servants and uh, retainers and, you know, everything you need in order to have a fully tricked out palace. Uh, most of the people that did that were eunuchs, as I understand it. And so that was the role they fulfilled. Now, there's another important fact here, which is that sometimes the emperor did not want to emperor. <laughs> there was... In particular, one guy in the early 1600s, I don't remember his name, but uh, he was the emperor of China for like 30, 40 years, whatever it was. And uh, he was not single-handedly responsible for the collapse of the Ming dynasty, but he played a big part. And uh, what happened is that this guy wanted to marry a concubine, which is not unusual for an emperor. You know, you got lots of ladies to choose from. But uh, he liked this one in particular, but his advisors told them that he could not. And, you know, again, I don't remember the specific details as to what the reason was, but they basically told him, you know, this is not really uh, auspicious. You know, you can't really do this. And so this guy had a multitude of options to go with. He could have said, OK, that's fine. I'll just pick somebody else. Or he could have said, fuck it, I'm emperor. I'm going to do what I want. I'm just going to marry her anyway, and there's nothing you can do about it. But this guy instead chose to just be butthurt about it for 20 years, during which time he just refused to make substantive decisions regarding governance. And because he did that, because he basically went on strike, it fell to his eunuchs to basically run the kingdom on his behalf. So, you know, people would want to come and see the emperor and the eunuchs would say, well, the emperor doesn't want to see anybody. Uh, he has instead delegated authority for this, that, or the other matter to me. And so as a result, the eunuchs basically ran the empire during this time period. And, you know, sometimes eunuchs could be good at their job, could be good governors. Sometimes they were corrupt as fuck. During this particular period, they were corrupt as fuck. And they exploited the shit out of the opportunity provided by this sort of temper tantrum. Mm. And uh, the misgovernance that resulted was one of the major contributing factors to the decline of the quality of Ming governance, as well as the decline of the Ming Empire's economy generally, which led directly into uh, the period of travails that led into the conquest of the Ming Dynasty by the uh, Manchu and the corresponding rise of the Qing Dynasty. So this illustrates the potential power of the eunuchs. You know, they were not necessarily innately powerful, but if, if an emperor was somehow indisposed to rule or was incapacitated, uh, they could rule in effect on his behalf. Uh, another thing they could do as well is to control access to the emperor. Even if the emperor was governing you know, properly, it was making an effort, 
uh, they were basically his secretaries, such that if somebody had some important business they needed to discuss, they could just stop them from meeting the emperor. And uh, they could demand in exchange some kind of bribe or quid pro quo of some other kind that was profitable to them. And, uh, you know, if you're, one, if you're running your palace well, ideally that doesn't happen. But, you know, obviously Chinese history is replete with examples of poor governance of one sort or another in one time period or another. So in those cases, uh, it could be quite damaging depending on the issue in question. But yeah, basically as gatekeepers to the emperor, uh, and given their privileged access to the emperor, eunuchs could be quite powerful politically uh, in Chinese politics. So that was basically their role. I would note that this guy is actually reading a book on China, so he would probably know better than me at this point. I'm just going off stuff I read years ago. But hopefully that's a satisfactory answer. Yeah, and it's not really something that we see as uh, very ethical nowadays. Changing someone's bodily configuration when they're not of age to consent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've just seen people recently complaining more about... Uh, oh, what's the word I want? Uh, uh, castration, that's not the word I want. What is it they do when you're born, like when you're a baby, and they cut off the foreskin? Circumcision. Thank you. That's the word. It wasn't coming. Yeah, I've heard people more recently complaining about circumcision. Mm -hmm. They're saying that it offers no benefit in, in terms of the health of the child, mm -hmm. and it comes with risk. It's a very small amount of risk, but you know, why take it at all if it offers no real benefit? So I've heard people kind of make that argument. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, in general today, we would not approve of castration in order to create a class of eunuchs who could act as public officials of one sort or another. Correct. That's the thing with norms, though, is I guess back in the day, that was just like, okay, that's their, that's their lot in life, and they deal with that, and that's how it's always been. And if for all the previous generations it had always been like that, uh, it's less likely you'll have people who are like, hey, this is wrong, we should stop this. Yeah, they, uh, I think in the Middle East, they did better. Like often they were major uh, civil servants, you know, bureaucrats in Middle Eastern regimes to the point where they could seize power. Like when you hear about slaves in the Middle East, they're not like slaves uh, like we had here in North America. You know, slaves in the Middle East could be, you know, chattel slaves. They could be, you know, menial laborers, but uh, often they were also skilled workers or even intellectuals who could serve in, uh, serve in offices of government. Um, you know, if you study the history of Egypt, there was uh, a period of rule under what was called the Mamluk dynasty. And uh, Mamluk is basically Arabic for slave, or maybe it's Egyptian for slave. I don't, I don't remember the details, but uh, basically that dynasty was founded by slaves. Uh, but they were educated slaves, you know, they were educated and served in government and they found it relatively easy to seize power. You know, one of the uh, tensions, historically speaking, between bureaucrats and rulers, uh, well, I should allow me to rephrase, uh, a common tension, historically speaking, is the tension between rulers and their civil servants. Uh, you know, if you're a king, you kind of need to delegate authority to uh, professionals in your bureaucracy to some degree. But if you delegate too much authority, uh, they can find it very easy to just use that authority to throw you out. You know, they could just use their control of the army or police or what have you and just say, okay, you're not king anymore. You know, now I'm going to be king. Mm -hmm. And so balancing uh, the power of bureaucrats uh, with your own power has been one of the main political games of uh, medieval societies. Uh, as well as, you know, societies even before the medieval period, uh, throughout much of human history. And uh, a lot of those, in the, you know, again, to bring this full circle in the context of uh, Egyptian society, if not broader Middle Eastern society as well, often that tension was specifically between kings and their slaves, whom were brought in to serve as those bureaucrats.
uh, the result in the case of the Mamluk dynasty being those slaves successfully seizing power and find, founding one of the great dynasties of the region. So not all of those guys were eunuchs, but I seem to recall a good number of them were. I think the Turks also used them, but I think that was different than the Janissaries. I think we do have some Turks, maybe? I don't see the flag, though. Oh, wait. Yeah, we have one. We have one Turk. Welcome. It, yeah, so maybe they know the answer to this. Um, Janissaries were different than eunuchs in the Ottoman Empire. So my question, but I also know that Janissaries often became bureaucrats. So my question then is how many bureaucrats were also eunuchs? Like, did the Janissaries have to become eunuchs to become bureaucrats? Or were there some young Janissaries that were put on an educational track to become bureaucrats who were uh, castrated? Or are, am I just mixing different groups of people up? That would be my question. <clears throat> I think people of Turkish heritage are one of the main demographics in Germany now. Yeah, they're the largest uh, ethnic minority group. I think they're still larger than the Arabs even. Even after the big immigration wave a couple years ago. Yeah, the funny thing about Turks in Germany is that the German government kind of has a weird relationship with them. Like they don't really allow them to fully naturalize. And, you know, maybe my knowledge on this is outdated, but... Uh, I remember reading that, uh, you know, even German, well, even Turks, rather, who had been living in Germany for decades, uh, had still not been offered the opportunity to fully naturalize, even though they spoke German and had kids who were like thoroughly German and whatnot. Yeah, the Turks were originally brought into Germany to be like uh, factory workers. You know, they had the big German economic miracle in the 1950s. And uh, that sort of catapulted the German economy forward and allowed recovery from World War II. But uh, they had something of a shortage of manpower, so they needed to import workers. And in Germany's case, they imported a lot of them from Turkey. But they didn't really want them to stay, per se, but they also didn't want to just kick them out. So they have this weird limbo, legally speaking, that they put them in. And I don't think that's ever been really fully resolved. You know, maybe we have some Germans listening who can kind of clear that up for me, but that's what I remember reading back in the day. <clears throat> yeah, I think pretty much every major country in Europe has a different approach to uh, immigration. You know, in Germany's case, it's sort of legal. It's a very technical approach, which is perhaps appropriate given their reputation. Uh, in France's case, it's thoroughly assimilationist. You know, France has always been home to a very muscular brand of uh, liberalism. So for them, the most important thing is to uh, assimilate people into the Republican French identity. So they don't really brook much uh, in the way of, uh, what, what would you call it, multiculturalism, I guess. That's almost a loaded term now that almost has a political context. So maybe that's not quite the right phrasing, but uh, yeah, in general, the French polity so to speak, in so much as there can be said to be a single polity in France, generally prefers the assimilationist approach. So that's kind of distinguished them from the Germans in that sense. The Germans haven't really taken much of an assimilationist approach. And then in Britain, they kind of have a managerial, multicultural type approach. You know, I remember reading that they had a, I guess it was one particular city, so maybe it's not representative, but in this one city, Maybe it was Birmingham. They'd set up, uh, what was it, councils. They'd set up like a council with representatives from each major ethnic minority. And the idea was that the council would be responsible for kind of easing tensions between them regarding this, that, or the other issue that cropped up. So it's kind of a prototypically status British approach. As it happens, none of these approaches have worked particularly well <laughs> with predictable results. It's one of the reasons that uh, immigration became a substantive, significant political issue in Europe. You know, nobody's really been quite able to figure out the formula to both uh, assimilate people, well, maybe not assimilate, but integrate 
uh, immigrants into society while at the same time doing so without sparking a backlash on the part of uh, this, that, or the other particular group uh, within native populations. It's a difficult balancing act, and uh, Europe is still kind of trying to figure it out. You know, one of the interesting things I remember reading back during the immigration crisis back in uh, you know, 2014, 2015, I remember reading that people in Serbia in general were opposed to the migrants that were moving through their country, but that they were actually pretty favorably disposed towards the migrants that were trying to settle in Serbia, which kind of surprised me. You know, generally, Eastern Europe is painted as being uniformly against immigration, but it seems that in that particular context at that time that they were not necessarily opposed to immigrants coming in to Serbia. They just didn't like that large numbers of them were basically just moving through it to go live in Germany. I'm sure we've got some Eastern Europeans listening who could maybe elaborate on that or disprove it or what have you, but I just thought that was an interesting bit of trivia from the time period in question. Are we doing okay on time? Yep. We've been on for an hour and a half. There was a question of whether you had thoughts on the James Webb telescope. Oh, I don't know. I'm not much. I'm not much for the fancy science, the hard science, the real science. Uh, I thought it was pretty cool. I think it's neat that they have something up there to kind of replace the uh, Hubble telescope. So I but haven't read heavily into it either but the main takeaways were this telescope is basically like a a tier upgrade it's not just like a slightly better version of the existing one we can look at a lot of different stuff that we couldn't previously so like oh. cosmic microwave background radiation that sort of stuff is uh, left over from the big bang so it should tell us a lot about the origins of the universe so a lot of people are really excited about the findings of that and the placement of the telescope is pretty cool because it's going to be orbiting behind the earth pretty much all the time maybe it's behind the moon someone can post an image of that i looked at it before but it's escaping me right now but the idea is the sun is shooting a bunch of photons and stuff and if you're trying to look at things that are pretty dim and pretty far away you don't want to have a, a big light blocking the vision so it's got a, a nice cozy spot that's pretty much always in the dark so it can see super far. Yeah, well, that'll be cool. Yeah. Lagrange 2 is the point behind Earth. That's what it's called. Thank you, chat. Range 2. Oh, that's right. <clears throat> yeah, I vaguely remember Lagrange from uh, Robotech from back in the day. Space Station Liberty was located on uh, Lagrange something. I forget which it was. Probably not a lot of Robotech fans left, though, so probably not a lot of people remember it. Uh, let's see. Do we have any more questions? I kind of noticed one while I was looking at your screen here. Sure, what'd you notice? We don't have a question <clears throat> handler per se, so I've just been reading and passing them along. Let me get it here in Notepad. So this one was asking about French Canadian culture as opposed to Canadian culture. Huh. I'm a French Canadian and have found that our level of nationalism is sort of similar to the Russian nationalism he was describing. Wouldn't surprise me. French nationalism is pretty potent. I mean, technically, technically, French nationalism was the OG nationalism. <laughs> they were pretty much the first to pioneer European style nationalism as we think of it today. Was it during Napoleon's era or when? Yeah, yeah. French Revolution. Hmm. You know, French liberals kind of took some ideas that have been percolating, 
percolating around European liberalism for a while and uh, sort of were able to actually implement them as a result of the overthrow of the uh, French king and the French Revolution. Mm. It uh, did not go entirely according to plan. As uh, historians, or at least those familiar with history, may remember from reading about the French Revolution, but they were able to very successfully inculcate a French identity that transcended things like regional differences, language differences, etc. So French nationalism, you know, the idea of a broader France of which you were a part uh, and having certain obligations to that France, that was kind of an idea that the French were able to implement policy-wise on a national level for the first time before pretty much anybody else. So it doesn't surprise me that there's a lot of residual French nationalism in French Canada. They also did a lot with just the general branding of French being a, a pioneer and leader when it comes to ideas. Mm -hmm. I think French was the main language for the sciences for a pretty long period of time before English overtook it, which is where the yeah. phrase lingua franca comes from. Yeah, and I never really figured out why that was. Why specifically. French were leading in the sciences or yeah because like uh well i mean i know that it happened but like in terms of the meta argument like why did it happen why did france emerge as a major leader mm -hmm. and when did it happen you know those kinds of questions i've asked before but i never got around to actually answering them i would you know my guess is that there would have been um, a lot of uh patronage on the part of the french government that maybe attracted a lot of thinkers and helped pay for them because mm -hmm. uh, patronizing intellectuals was kind of a big deal in Renaissance Europe, you know, 1400s up through the uh, 1700s, if not also the 1800s. Uh, you know, if you were kind of well off as a king or a prince or a merchant or what have you, you could kind of flaunt your wealth by uh, paying an artist to go and do a great work of art or an architect to do a great building or something, or as it may be, to pay an intellectual to go and do some cool philosophy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know some of that was just happening regardless you know, there were universities at the time where ideas like that were sort of spreading around and uh, the invention of the printing press also facilitated the spread of liberal ideas but uh, as far as to why the French were able to pioneer so many well were able to produce so many leading intellectuals I've always kind of been curious what the genesis of that was historically so if anybody has any cool links to that effect I'd be interested but yeah, you're right, you know, because they led the way early on, the French language became uh, the language of academia, mm -hmm. kind of supplanting Latin to a degree in doing so. I'm trying to think of uh, French Canada here. Yeah, the English did not treat them particularly well for maybe the first couple decades. Because obviously France controlled it originally, but then the British took it in the uh, Seven Years' War. In dramatic fashion, I might add. The Battle of Quebec is uh, pretty wild. You know, if you know the geography of Quebec, that is to say the city of Quebec, it's kind of up on an elevated... Uh, plateau almost mm -hmm. and on one side of the plateau is a sheer cliff which is next to the river and so the French understandably assumed that that side was safe but it was actually that sheer cliff that the British scaled and they actually attacked the French from the rear you know surprising them and that's how they seized uh, Quebec and in turn how they seized French Canada hmm. it's a pretty cool battle <clears throat> And after that, you know, the British were not particularly well inclined towards Catholics. You know, the British had been rivals of Catholics for a long time. Since King Henry VIII got his marriage denied. <laughs> That's what I'm, I immediately thought of King Henry whenever you're mentioning the emperor who wanted to marry a concubine and they said no. It's like, well, that happened to King Henry VIII. He wanted a divorce and they said no. And he was like, fine, I'm making the Church of England. <laughs> Heck you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a pretty bold move. Yeah, but he pulled it off. 
Yeah, that was, uh, well, in the Chinese case, I think it was more political than religious. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah, that's a, that's a pretty cool, and that's a correct analogy there. But yeah, and the, wait, what? Oh, damn, where was I going with that? We're talking about uh, French Canada. Oh, right, right, French Canada. <clears throat> So the British didn't treat them particularly well for like the first couple decades because they were rivals. Uh, well, because they didn't particularly like uh, the Catholics. And it wasn't really until the early 1800s, I want to say, that they started kind of implementing reforms that eased up on them. And uh, well, actually, I think they did it earlier than that. Because here's the thing, during the Revolutionary War here in the US, uh, or here in North America, however you want to phrase that, it was broadly assumed by the revolutionaries in the U.S. that French Canada would want to join them in revolting against the British, because it was assumed that you know the French Canadians would not want you know did not want to be a part of the British Empire. Uh, but as it happened, French Canada did not rise up against the British government to side with the American revolutionaries. Uh, you know there were definitely problems with the British, but in general, I remember reading that. In, relations had improved over time and that they were treated better by the 1770s than they had been before and i also read that one of the reasons they didn't want to join the revolutionaries is that there was still some rivalry with the you know, with the uh british english colonists uh in the 13 colonies you know basically for much of the 1600s in fact you know pretty much all of the 1600s and through much of the 1700s uh, there had been a rivalry, you know, between Quebec and uh, the English colonies for territory, you know, specifically the Ohio Territory. And, uh, you know, there had been a couple wars between England and France in that time, and there was always, there was always some raiding that went on. And uh, also in the 1600s in particular, the English colonies were sort of known for their fundamentalism. You know, they were very much uh, hardcore fundamentalist Protestants. Uh, you know, of one denomination or another, but in general, all of them were not particularly well disposed towards Catholics. And so by the late 1700s, you know, a lot of American religion had kind of lost its hard edge from the 1600s. But even so, the sort of residual cultural memory in French Canada of the colonists being sort of these retrograde uh, Christian Protestant fundamentalists still remained. And that kind of prejudiced them to a degree against the colonists. So when they rose up in revolution, it was not actually that intuitive for the French Canadians to join them because they kind of in, assumed implicitly that they hated them, <laughs> that they would not uh, get along particularly well. So for those reasons, the fr French Canada did not join in the American Revolution. And there was actually a pretty nasty failed attempt by the revolutionaries to seize Quebec. They invaded French Canada, but ended up getting obliterated. They actually did it again in the War of 1812, but it failed miserably, even more miserably in the War of 1812 than it did in the, the Revolutionary War. Although to be fair, in the case of the War of 1812, the uh, forces that had been arrayed to invade French Canada did not actually want to be there. Uh, a lot of the American military in the War of 1812 was actually comprised of state militias because the US army wasn't all that big, you know, what really wasn't big enough to be invading anybody. And uh, the trouble is that uh, the militia that was raised to fight with the army to invade French Canada was largely from the Northeast, you know, which makes sense. That's where the border with Canada was, specifically French Canada. And uh, the militias from New York and Massachusetts and whatnot were not in the least bit interested in the War of 1812. They really did not want to go to war with Britain because, uh, you know, if you're living in the Northeast, uh, a good chunk of your money, you know, a good chunk of the economy came from trade with England. And uh, disrupting that trade with war was not at all a popular proposition to the point where the Northeastern states considered succeeding from the Union. Uh, this was the first succession crisis in the young United States. And, uh, it, you know, it didn't end up working. You know, they didn't end up succeeding. But, you know, it just shows the degree to which people in the Northeastern U.S. were upset. So, Obviously, the state militias that were raised from that population were not at all enthused about invading Canada. And so their morale and uh, esprit de corps were very low, to put it mildly. And the result is that when the invasion actually happened, or at least was scheduled to happen, 
uh, a lot of those state militias basically just said, we're not going. And the result is that the U.S. Army was not large enough, you know, in those regions to launch the invasion. And so they basically just had to cancel it. Yeah, that was part of a, uh, I want to say, three-pronged invasion of Canada that had been planned. You know, they were going to invade French Canada from around Lake Champlain in upper New York. And then they were also going to invade uh, the Niagara Peninsula from both the western and eastern isthmuses. And I think the Niagara Peninsula invasion happened as planned, but it ended up being a disaster for different reasons. But yeah, people pretty upset about that. That you know, the fact that a, a major invasion had to be had to be canceled just because of militia opposition goes to show you how wild and woolly America was back in the day. Ah, we were going to invade, but we faced some resistance, so uh, pack it up. <laughs> So yeah, French Canada stayed part, of the, stayed part of Canada after that, and things were relatively quiet. And, you know, reforms were implemented, Catholics got more rights, etc., etc. So, you know, conditions improved, and uh, people didn't really complain too much. And I want to say, what, I think the next trivia, <laughs> I think the next trivia I remember about French Canada was uh, World War II. And maybe this was true for World War One as well. You know, maybe we have some French Canadians here who can kind of correct me. But uh, in World War II, the Canadian government faced pressure from Quebec not to draft French Canadians into the Canadian army to fight in the war. And uh, the Quebec, you know, politicians were sufficiently powerful that the Canadian government actually agreed. So, as I understand it, there were no French Canadian soldiers drafted into the Canadian Army during World War II. There were volunteers, there were some people who fought. Uh, but unlike the English speaking population outside of Quebec, they were not drafted. And uh, I think partly that just had to do with a desire not to have to fight and die for the British Empire, for one. But I think also there was a particular desire not to get involved after France collapsed. I think that was kind of more their sentimental connection to the war. But again, somebody more familiar with the subject would know better than me, and I would encourage them to contribute and chat if they could. <clears throat> but yeah, that just illustrates that there was still some communal tension there. And uh, what, the next thing, this doesn't really matter per se, but uh, Charles de Gaulle visited Quebec in the, I want to say the early, maybe late 40s or early 50s or maybe it was even during World War II, I don't remember. Let's say 1940s. And uh, he visited on a ship with a French flag on it. And the thing is, when you visit a foreign port, uh, normally you don't fly your national flag. Like, uh, I don't remember the specific details of this norm, but basically uh, in nautical culture, that's kind of a no-no. You're not really supposed to do that. But de Gaulle sailed up the St. Lawrence Seaway on this ship that just flew the French national flag loud and proud, and it caused a minor diplomatic kerfuffle because uh, obviously you know France I mean I don't think there's a lot of irredentist sentiment in Quebec or France as far as reuniting together uh, but the idea that de Gaulle would just kind of sail up like he owned Quebec was somewhat disconcerting it made some people unhappy in Canada so that would have been roughly the 1940s and uh, what I think over time you know just to kind of zoom out a little bit here over time uh the english speaking population of montreal in particular which is the largest city in quebec grew and uh over time what i think something like i guess i don't know exactly what proportion of the city spoke english as opposed to french at its height uh, but it grew to a de pretty decent sized and uh you know that's worth mentioning because montreal was the economic heart of canada for most of its canada's history and so that kind of illustrates how important Quebec was economically to Canada for much of Canada's history. Now, that changed in the 1990s. And what happened in the 1990s is that uh, separatist sentiment in Quebec kind of hit a fever pitch. Well, it's not just that separatist, separatist sentiment, you know, kind of escalated. It was also that the Canadian government was more willing uh, to allow more separatist sentiment to proliferate. So... 
between the two forces, the result was a referendum on independence for Quebec that was held, I want to say, in like 1995. And it failed very narrowly. It was like 52% or something that voted against independence. Ooh. Yeah, and that was particularly humorous because something like 10% or so of Quebec's population is uh, English speaking. So that's probably, given that, you know, if you're an English speaker, you're probably almost certainly going to vote against independence. That probably means that it was actually the English speakers that uh, kind of decided the referendum, you know, ironically. But that also just illustrates how split even French speakers in Quebec were about the subject. So, you know, maybe not that bad a thing in the grand scheme of things. But the result, uh, well, I guess not the result of the referendum, but, you know, that illustrates how prominent separatist sentiment was in the 90s. But another thing that happened is that there was a, a new law that was passed that basically required everybody to speak French and to have French signage in Montreal. Well, if not, if not Quebec in general, I don't remember which. Uh, but the impact of that is that most of the English speaking population of Montreal ended up relocating to Toronto. Or at least a good chunk of it did. You know, the big the bigger problem was the business community kind of pulled out because a lot of the businessmen in Montreal were English speakers, and so they left and set up shop in Toronto. And as a result, the 1990s saw a shift uh, in the economic influence of Montreal uh, and Toronto. You know, before Montreal had kind of been the beating heart of Canada's economy, but afterwards Toronto became more important economically. And uh, I'm sure there were other trends at play. I don't want to just pin this entirely on the uh, French separatists, but they definitely played a role there. So as a result, Toronto is now the more prominent city in Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, Montreal is still very important, but it's not as important as it used to be. And uh, part of the reason is sort of this French-Canadian nationalism that cropped up. I'm sure it's still there, but I haven't heard as much about it since then. Uh, certainly, you know, to kind of abstract away again into uh, Canadian politics, Quebec politics and uh, the politics of Frenchness and French language politics are definitely a part of uh, Canadian politics as a whole. Uh, you know, because uh, Quebec separatist or Quebec nationalist parties, however you want to characterize them, do hold so many seats in Quebec, uh, it kind of behooves uh, political parties in Canada outside Quebec to maintain positive relations with them so that they can get their votes on issues of national importance. And so uh, in so much as Quebec voters are swing voters, or at least as in so much as Quebec politicians are kingmakers in Canadian politics, uh, Quebec politics then are disproportionately important in Canadian politics correspondingly. But that probably kind of depends on the political era. There may be some eras where a mainstream political party in Canada is able to pick up votes in Quebec. And in that case, the nationalist politics in Quebec are probably relatively less important. You know, somebody more important with the history of Canadian politics would uh, know better than me on that. But I remember it being discussed in a YouTube video I watched, uh, I don't know, a couple years ago, I guess. Uh, the guy was kind of talking about how Justin Trudeau, obviously being a very progressive politician, uh, was a somewhat odd partner for some of the nationalist, conservative, Quebecois separatist politicians whom he kind of had to work with in order to get legislation passed. And, you know, in general, the French in Quebec are kind of similar to the French in France in so much as they tend to be very assimilationist in their view of how to deal with immigrants. So, you know, they're very open to people traveling to Quebec, but you kind of have to become French. That's sort of their perspective. Mm -hmm. But that perspective is kind of at odds with the English perspective, you know, the more British perspective, if not also the American perspective, which is that you should be more multicultural and more tolerant and to allow people to express themselves and be different. So in that sense, uh, Justin Trudeau and his progressive, uh, polit you know, his progressive style of politics is somewhat at odds with that French style of politics that's prominent in Quebec, uh, but they still work together, you know, basically out of expediency. Quebecois. 
And I guess I can't talk about Quebec without talking about the Montreal Canadiens. <laughs> <laughs> Hockey is a big sport in uh, Canada, obviously, you know, the most popular sport, but it's also the most popular sport in Quebec. So that's kind of something all of the different parts of Canada share in common. And, uh, so, you know, some interesting trivia for you. Uh, there's a famous movie, a famous hockey movie in Canada called Slapshot. And it's something of a cult classic in Canadian cinema. And there's lots of, you know, movie references and whatnot that have kind of bled over into the popular culture. But uh, interestingly, when they made the movie, they of course made a French dub of the movie to release in Quebec. And the interesting thing about the dub is that they were very creative in how they adapted the English, uh, how, they, how they adapted the English script. Because they could have just done a very direct translation, but it wouldn't have really captured the meaning of the words, you know, sort of the meanings of the slang and the jokes and whatnot. And uh, so the translators took a very sort of expansive liberal approach, if you will, <laughs> to the translation. And the result was some very creative language that has become very prominent in Quebecois slang. So Slapshot is not just important to Canadian culture in general, but it's also important to Quebecois culture because of that dub. You know, it's had an impact. Yep, chat saying it's a classic. Yeah, I remember, uh, I'm trying to think of some other Quebec stuff. I guess this isn't particularly coherent at this point, but I was trying to learn more about like uh, how French people in France think about Quebec, uh, you know, culturally speaking. Because obviously here in the United States, the corollary is the relationship between British people and American people. So, you know, we're sort of, uh, we kind of look up to British people as being sort of fancy and intellectual and smarter than us and being more refined and what have you. And then the British in turn kind of see Americans as being somewhat crude, shall we say, <laughs> to put it mildly, and a little bit unrefined and a little bit more, at the same time, a little bit more proactive and more open and a little more uh, perhaps hearty, if you like. So that's sort of a quick rough summary of the relationship culturally between British people and American people. So I was kind of curious if there was something similar between French people and Quebecois people. And uh, what I found is that there's not really one, you know, there is kind of a sense from what I read anyway, and I'm not like a, an expert on this. So, you know, chat is definitely encouraged to elaborate on this. But uh, my impression was that people in Quebec do kind of look up to uh, France as kind, kind of the motherland, you know, it's the metropole, it's sort of the originator of French culture and refined culture, French literature, French cinema, etc. Uh, but at the same time, I don't know that there's as much of an impression of them as being like super, being much more intelligent and refined uh, than they are, sort of like with the Anglo-American analogy. And also, as for the French impression of the Quebecois, from what I read, they kind of see them as being fairly provincial, you know, still being kind of undeveloped almost, which I thought was interesting since it's obviously kind of a built up, you know, first world territory. But they don't seem to pay that much attention to them, you know. So I guess it's kind of an unfair comparison because, you know, the United States is a superpower, you know, our culture and politics is just everywhere. So Quebec obviously doesn't quite have the same reach. So maybe it's it's kind of an apples and oranges comparison to compare uh, Franco-Quebecois relationships with Anglo-American relationships. But, uh, I thought it was a question worth exploring anyway. So, But yeah, in general, the French kind of see Quebec as being more provincial from what I read. And uh, the Quebecois, to a degree, see the French as being kind of more sophisticated and cultured. But uh, otherwise, don't quite have that same relationship the Americans have with the British. I think one of the reputations that the U.S. gets is that we love guns. That's one of our our things that is different from Britain's. Everybody has a gun. Nobody can invade us. Everybody has a gun. Okay. More uh, risk-seeking people in the U.S., maybe. Yeah, more risk seeking. Um, some might say more barbaric. 
you know, have you ever, oh god, what was it? I'm going to try to look this up real quick. There was a competition that was not uncommon on the frontier. Specifically the frontier in like the late 1700s, early 1800s. And it was kind of more of a southern Appalachian type thing. And uh, these competitions were basically the contemporary equivalent of uh, UFC, you know, ultimate fighting. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to be able to find it off the top of my head here, but basically the competition was just no holds barred. Like there were no rules, like up to and including gouging out your opponent's eyes. And apparently that was a, a sufficient problem that it was not uncommon to find people who were blinded in one eye just because they'd been fighting in this style of fighting. Uh, I'd also read that some people who competed actually grew out their fingernails specifically so that they would be better able to eye gouge. Oh. Yeah, it was pretty brutal from the description I was reading of it. That's the kind of sort of frontier ruggedness, I guess, that you could kind of find out on the frontier at that time. Uh, people also were not all that religious. I mean, they were religious, they believed, but uh, religious institutions were kind of few and far behind, behind, few and far between, rather, on the frontier, to the point where there was actually a concerted push by proselytizers to move into uh, the American frontier in the late 1700s, early 1800s, to try to sort of teach people, well, not teach people religion, but to kind of reintegrate them into broader religious institutions. I think specifically Presbyterians were the most successful in doing so, but there were also others who tried to do so as well. Yeah, the Scots-Irish are really interesting. The Scots-Irish were the uh, ethnic group, if you like, that principally were responsible for settling the Appalachian region of the United States. You know, it's basically a mountainous region, sort of uh, inland, just inland of the East Coast. And uh, they were kind of attracted to it because it was somewhat more similar to the territory they were from back in uh, the UK. But also it's just what was available. They generally were relatively poor and the land up in the mountainous areas was much less in demand, obviously, because it was much less fertile and arable. And so they ended up kind of uh, carving out a rough living out, out in those mountains. And uh, the Scots-Irish are interesting because they're kind of uh, the result of multiple levels of filtering that basically just carved out like the ultimate frontiersman because uh, originally a lot of them were actually from the border region between scotland and england which used to be pretty war-torn you know it was not uncommon for conflicts to happen uh not just between like england and scotland either like uh communal type conflicts between different clans and tribes and whatnot so it was a particularly quarrelsome area and so of that you know, people that emerged in that. They were very familiar with conflict and how to survive. And uh, a certain portion of that population was chosen to be relocated, or at least was encouraged to settle in Northern Ireland uh, because the English obviously were settling Ireland for, you know, much of the past thousand years or so. Uh, but in this particular era, I think it was more like 1400s, 1500s, they started settling some Scottish people from this border region into Northern Ireland. And of course, the Irish people were pretty restive themselves. And so the result was uh, internecine ethnic conflict between the Scottish settlers and the uh, Irish natives. And of course, the Scots didn't always get along with the English government either. So they also fought with them sometimes. So the result then is that you have the first filtering where you have uh, native Scottish people being subjected to border conflicts. Uh, between England and Scotland. And then of those people, you take them out and put them in Ireland where they're further filtered, uh, subjected to you know ethnic violence with the Irish and conflict with the English government. So then they're even more familiar with conflict. And of that population then, you take out a subsection and relocate them across the Atlantic Ocean and put them on the American frontier where they have to fight not only with angry Native Americans who obviously don't want people stealing their land, but also not unroutinely, uh, it's not a word, not uncommonly fight with uh, colonial governments and the English government as well. So that's three layers of filtering and the result is the uh, Scots-Irish settler living on the American frontier whom is pretty tough. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
that's a that's a pretty interesting way to kind of filter your way into a very tuck into a very tough ethnic group which is kind of native to the united states mm. and very much a product of that unique history and so it's kind of no surprise then that you end up with that sort of weird competition that ultra violent competition i mentioned that's uh the sort of thing that you might expect from people who kind of come from that background, you know, yeah. just very clannish, hyper competitive, you know, tough, not averse to violence. It's uh, it kind of makes sense if you think about it in that way. I yeah. don't want to oversell the point. I don't want to just like say that they're barbarians and that people descended from Scots Irish people are barbarians. But uh, yeah, the origins of the Scots Irish in America are kind of interesting in this way and how they kind of uh, were carved out through successive waves of violent experiences into tough frontiersmen. Yeah, and the whole process of expanding west was a really risky choice to make and one that involved a lot less of the usual infrastructure that would have existed if you stayed in a European city, for example, where there's already a well-established police force maybe it's better maybe it's worse but at least it is an institution you're going out to places where there is no institution and if you have some issue you need to solve it yourself so i think a lot of that self-reliance attitude americans have very strongly just as a aspect of the culture yeah even if it's not necessary anymore a lot of times they'll place really high value in that because they see it as a defining characteristic <clears throat> Texas being a prime example. Yeah. Actually, a lot of Scots-Irish settled Texas originally. But the Scots-Irish kind of centered in Appalachia, but then a lot of them moved over into uh, the territory between the Ohio and Tennessee rivers, which was a very attractive area, you know, a very fertile land and whatnot. And that was also uh, the land on the other side of the Cumberland Gap, which is one of the few parts of the Appalachian Mountains that was passable. So a lot of would-be settlers uh, wanting to get on the other side of the mountains kind of filtered through that gap. And as a result, one of the first places west of the Appalachian settled was Kentucky and Tennessee. And not everybody who settled there was Scots-Irish. There was a lot of people from all over the Americas uh, that came there. Well, I should say uh, the United States, rather, not the Americas. Uh, a lot of soldiers who fought in the Revolutionary Army uh, were paid in land, basically. And uh, a good chunk of them ended up on, you know, over in Kentucky and Tennessee, basically as compensation for their service. <clears throat> so there was kind of some diversity there, but the largest group, as I understand it, was the Scots-Irish. And so they expanded west then through that sort of little tunnel between the two rivers and then ended up in Arkansas. And uh, eventually that was sort of the area where Stephen Austin went when he was trying to gather people to settle in the colony that he had been granted by the Mexican government in Texas. And so a lot of the early settlers in southern Texas that first settled here uh, were from that region specifically. And, you know, there were others too. You know, there was people from the uh, south, from like Alabama and Mississippi, and there were even some Europeans there. There was at least one French guy who fought at the uh, Alamo, for example. But uh, Scots-Irish definitely had disproportionate influence. Yeah, the Scots-Irish are kind of like, uh, well, I don't want to kind of single them out as like one of the only examples, but they're an example of the kind of people that are uniquely American. Like, obviously, everybody here kind of came from either Europe or Africa. But once they came here and lived here for, you know, generations, you know, for successive centuries, uh, the experience of living on the frontier and living in America kind of carved them into a new cultural group. And so uh, it's kind of interesting to kind of look at those groups and how they've emerged and evolved over time. You know, the Scots-Irish being uh, one example, the one that I talked about, but also, you know, African-Americans, for example, mm -hmm. uh, or Midwesterners, for example, or, uh, you know, the Northeast U.S., which is kind of a, a little bit different because they've had like lots of different waves of immigration that have kind of uh, supplanted or merged with the pre-existing population. Uh, so that's more about cultural merging than adapting to the land per se. Uh, but Midwest and uh, the South, definitely, you can kind of see that emergence of new cultures happening in response to the experience of living on the frontier and living in uh, the United States. And sort of those cultures are kind of the foundation for what you might call uh, 
the Jeffersonian democratic tradition in American politics. You know, that, I mean, obviously you can kind of see that anywhere, you know, in pretty much any part of the United States, but it seems to be particularly acute in the Midwest and the South and sort of the West more broadly. There were waves from different areas of the world as well. Like, wasn't there a, a period where there are a bunch of Chinese immigrants to the U.S.? Kind of. There was a period where there was a lot of Chinese immigrants coming in. Uh, those were, uh, I want to say that was like the late 1800s or so. Because I think the Chinese Exclusion Act was like sometime between 1900 and 1910. That was when they basically just said, no more Chinese immigrants, you can't come. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was in response to an immigration wave from China. But I don't think it was nearly as big as the European wave happening at the same time. Right. Do you know what caused the Chinese wave? Or at least motivated it? The part of it was just development over in California. You know, they had the gold rush in the 1840s. And then they had railroad construction in the 1850s and 60s, all of which required labor. Uh, and there was obviously there was a labor shortage out there because hardly anybody lived there. You know, I mean, I guess there were some Native Americans, but they weren't particularly interested. Uh, so the result is that they had to kind of get labor wherever they could get it. And uh, Chinese laborers were one source of labor for the construction of infrastructure out west in that period. So that was kind of the pull factor. But I'm not sure about the push factor. I'm not sure what was going on in China at the time. That would have pushed them out i do know or at least i think i know anyway from what i was reading years ago uh the majority of chinese immigrants to the united states at the time were from southeastern china specifically fujian province mm -hmm. which have i talked about this before fujian province i believe so. yeah okay that's like where guangzhou and stuff is oh no that's guangdong Oh, that's kind of, that's like where hong kong and guangzhou is and those other places delta the delta uh, the Pearl River Delta, that's Guangdong. Uh, Fujian is sort of northeast of Guangdong. It's, uh, I think it borders it. I think it's like the next state over. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I guess I'm, I guess I'll just apologize here if this is like, if I'm repeating myself, if I've talked about this before. Um, but yeah, Fujian province is responsible for a disproportionate share of, uh, Chinese emigrants coming out of China. Uh, because uh, people, the people of Fujian have a long history of traveling abroad for work. You know, historically, they've often been the merchants that traveled overseas to places like uh, Manila in the Philippines uh, or the Malacca Strait uh, down in present day Indonesia in order to conduct trade. And so in that sense, they've actually sort of been the regional merchants for a lot of uh, countries in the region, you know. Uh, in places like Indonesia and the Philippines, there's a lot of people who have Chinese descent and are descended from merchants who came from China. And a lot of them originally originated from Fujian province. And uh, the United States was no different. A lot of the uh, you know laborers that came over from China traveled, traveled overseas from Fujian province, uh, trying to make money that they could send back to their families. <clears throat> you know, if we'd allowed them to stay, they probably would have built up and been a kind of a neat little cultural niche group like a Fujian American you know they probably would have been like their own little group there but uh, unfortunately they were not granted the opportunity to so develop on account of the Chinese Exclusion Act so that didn't work out uh, I don't want to completely rule out all other groups in China obviously China is a huge place I'm sure there were workers from other parts of China too but uh, the people of Fujian are particularly noted for their proclivity to leaving China to work abroad you know even today even today, a disproportionate share of the labor, the Chinese laborers who work in the United States doing a blue collar type work, disproportionately, those are people from Fujian. Um, there's a lot more people living in, there's a lot more Chinese people living in the United States now than there used to be. And most of them are not from Fujian. Most of them are students who come from, you know, all kinds of all different parts of China. So, you know, the Fujianese are no longer like uh, the, the main group like they used to be. But, uh, you know, if you control for students and other people coming to work in like the tech sector, if you're just looking at blue collar workers, my understanding is that they're still disproportionately uh, predominant there amongst that particular group. 
I think I've also heard that there's a fair number of Cantonese here, but I haven't heard as much about them. I imagine there's more money to be made in uh, actual Guangdong than there is overseas, so probably they, they're more likely to stay home than they used to be. But in Fujian, it's still relatively poor. It hasn't been one of the Chinese provinces that's done as well. It definitely does better than some provinces in the interior of China. Uh, but the terrain in Fujian is not like super conducive to economic activity. It's very mountainous. It's hard to build infrastructure. So, you know, it's a, it's a little more isolated from the rest of China. So as a result, I think it's just kind of easier to travel abroad. And there's just a long tradition of it too. You know, to a degree, it's almost like a cultural expectation, a cultural norm, if you will, that uh, the sons of the family, if not also the daughters, just kind of travel abroad to try to make money to send back to the family. <laughs> you know, I don't know how true that is today since Fujian has developed, you know, over the past couple of decades, but it certainly used to be kind of part of the culture there. But yeah, basically, I don't know. <laughs> To bring this full circle, I don't know what the push factor would have been within Fujian and within China that would have pushed so many people in the late 1800s to come out when they did. Uh, there may not have been one, actually. It may have just been technological. One of the innovations that emerged in the 1880s were steam passenger ships, which had not really been a thing before then. You know, They had kind of existed in a limited capacity. Uh, but in the 1880s, there was regular uh, passage. Well, there were regular ships. What's the word I'm looking for? There was a regular movement of steamships from Europe to the United States and vice versa. And so that meant that there was much cheaper passage provided uh, for that trip. You know, it used to be relatively expensive, but in the 1880s, it became fairly cheap. And that corresponded then with a huge uh, migration wave of people from Italy uh western russia as well as other parts of europe you know that the kind of a, that immigration wave is disproportionately responsible for the ethnic makeup of uh the northeastern U us even today but at the same time it could be that uh steamships also provided much cheaper passage from the west coast of america to china and vice versa so it could just be that it was just much cheaper and easier to uh, transport large numbers of workers from East Asia to the Western US. Uh, so that could have been, you know, the factor that kind of pushed Chinese people into coming over in much larger numbers than they had before. Yeah, there's a lot of movement of workers from China and India also to plantations uh, around the world, especially European colonies. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago, for example, which is a Caribbean island nation uh, here in North America, uh, that country is disproportionately descended from migrants from India whom were brought to work on British plantations on the island. And as a result, it's the only part of the Western Hemisphere that has a substantive Hindu population. It's also got a pretty decent sized Muslim population as well, since there's a lot of, obviously there's a lot of Muslims who live in India, so they also made the trip to Trinidad. So a little interesting demographic trivia for you. I do not know. Yeah, railroads, steamships, and uh, I guess those would be the main factors. Yeah, California back during the mid-1800s was a pretty wild place. You know, it was very isolated. It was hard to get to. There really wasn't a lot of reason to go there. So for a long time, it was very unpopulated. Obviously, it had very fertile land, so I guess I shouldn't say there wasn't any reason to go there. But you know, even as good as the land was, it was a long-ass trip to have to make. And it was probably relatively hard to get your produce to market, given how far away the markets were. But then when they found gold, everything changed because with the gold there, suddenly it became economical to supply isolated settlements in California to a degree that was not the case before. So there was a massive influx of people, capital, money, supplies, you know, just anything you can think of. 
and it kind of really resulted in the settlement of early California. San Francisco in particular was basically the gateway you know, into California for obvious reasons, you know, geographic reasons. And so kind of way out in this isolated part of the world, you could, you had what was in effect a modern city that just kind of popped up almost overnight. It's uh, pretty wild. You know. Settlement of the Western Hemisphere is a wild story pretty much from beginning to end. <laughs> any way you want to slice it, but that particular chapter, the settlement of California and the emergence and creation of a modern city way out on the uh, west coast of the United States was definitely one of the interesting chapters. Yeah, I'm trying to think, there was a guy who wrote a book about I guess I shouldn't say ethnic groups per se, but his idea was to try to break down the differences between different groups of Americans. Uh, well, more specifically, he wanted to separate Americans into different groups based off of uh, political preferences, demographic lineage, and geography. You know, it's not an uncommon kind of game basically to try to think of, try to group different states together into uh, like-minded cultural groups. Uh, you know, I did that for a geography class back when I was in college, but this particular author really tried to dig deep into data that he could get a hold of to try to see uh, to what degree one could trace modern political preferences and modern demographics to previous demographic changes and previous settlement patterns. And uh, he pretty he did a pretty decent job from what I remember of it. I don't think I ever did sit down and read the book, but I did read some of the reviews and some of the uh, articles that he read that he wrote based off of his research. And uh, one of the groups was the Scots-Irish one that I told you about. Mm -hmm. There was another one which was like Deep South, which was kind of more descended from uh, plantation owners who migrated from the Caribbean. And uh, obviously also, you know, African descendants, African lineage, African lineage rather, for a good chunk of the Southern population uh, stemming from slavery. Uh, one of the interesting ones was the Tidewater culture which is sort of the east coast of Virginia and Maryland. And that was an interesting culture because unlike the other cultures, it did not really expand into the interior of the United States like the other ones did. So it's kind of an isolated culture there on the coast on the coastal region in Chesapeake Bay. And it's kind of dying, you know, it's kind of withering. It has it's kind of being assimilated by surrounding cultural groups, so it may not be around much longer. But it was actually disproportionately powerful for much of the early history of the United States because a lot of it was basically planter culture, you know, plantation owners tried to recreate a kind of uh, European nobility there. And so they were very well off, but they also invested heavily in education such that a lot of the early intellectuals and early architects and, you know, early this, that, or the other in the United States were people from this region. And that lasted probably until the second half of the 1800s when uh, other groups started to kind of usurp them. It seems like we're experiencing a general mass extinction of just local cultures with the advent of the internet and international travel and so on. Where Actually, it's the other way around. You think so? Yeah, well, I used to think so too, like you, you know, I was, I kind of figured, oh, you know, the, this mass media is going to be used to assimilate people and it's going to be harder and harder for people to kind of maintain cultural differences. But there was a study done recently in which they found that actually, th well, specifically they were looking at like regional accents in the United States, mm -hmm. uh, regional American accents. And what they found is that the regional accents have actually become stronger over the past few decades, not weaker. And so uh, that line of thinking kind of suggests that actually the internet, while it has the potential you know, to be a homogenizing force, is actually being used to try and preserve differences and propagate differences. And, uh, you know, I guess to a degree you could point to something like hyper-partisanship in politics as being one example. But uh, a more positive example is that traditional cultures like, say, Native American cultures that might otherwise die out are being uh, propagated and reproduced in part by using modern technology and mass communication to try to preserve them uh, to a degree that would not have been possible before. Hmm. So actually... It could well be that uh, differences are maintained, hopefully yeah, in I a positive way. If I 
link this up with a similar thought about how with technology advancing, it creates new forms of employment with technology advancing and a lot of niche communities like what's up Twitch chat. People on Twitch kind of speak a certain way and you can go to different message boards, online communities, like different internet clicks form and they have their own way of speaking, their own terms that they use amongst each other that might be shared in a way that you could look at it kind of like it's a, a regional dialect, but it's a region of the internet as opposed to in person. Like one thing that I say a lot in my stream and most people know it is at this point is saying that something is bis. What, what is bis? Like is that that's not an English word. It's an abbreviation for best in slot, which is a way for saying that something is really good. We'll also say stuff like pog or pog champion allowed about something, which is an emote. And you'll just say it out loud. Anyone who isn't a, a Twitch user is like, what on the earth are you saying? But language is developing. I guess we are innovating as fast as stuff could be dying out. And as you're saying, maybe it's the opposite of it allows us to link up with other people who maybe have a similar cultural background, but you've been separated geographically for some reason. That's well, it's also worth it's also worth mentioning that the internet has uh, been very conducive to the emergence of subcultures to a degree that was not possible before. You know people who have an interest in a fringe topic or issue or what have you, whom previously had no way of really finding each other and creating a group and now can. And that's resulted in the production of these sort of niche online cultures that have popped up in this, that, or the other place. So, you know, that's an example of how new culture can be created, but in so much as it's representative of a small niche culture that evolves differently from mainstream culture, that could be an example of the kind of mechanism by which regional cultures that previously were in the process of being homogenized are now in the process of being preserved. Mm -hmm. Pretty neat. Yeah, we live in strange times. It's refreshing too whenever your intuition leads you to think something and then there's just a data point that says the opposite. Yeah, I was pretty surprised myself. We got a yes. question about Argentina. Yeah, I noticed we got a couple here. Moss is on the case. Thank you, Moss. Thank you, Moss. What's your take on the inevitability of decentralized finance? <clears throat> That's a big question. Yeah, we talked a little bit about that a couple weeks ago, talking about how uh, you know crypto, well, specifically blockchain technology, had the potential, and specifically new payment technologies, you know, payment processing technologies had the potential to severely disrupt established finance. So I don't know how inevitable it is because it could be that the direction it takes is so disruptive that maybe established authorities uh, try to scupper it. <laughs> but it could also be that the technology involves in such a way that it's impossible for an authority to scupper it. So in that case, it really is inevitable, but I don't know. I'm not sufficiently familiar with the technology to really know just how easy it would be for a dedicated actor to disrupt it or render it inoperable. So you would have to talk to somebody more familiar with the technical side of the subject to get an answer on that. Certainly there's a lot of demand for more decentralized finance, not least because there's a lot of mistrust of the authorities responsible for managing money in the economy. So, so long as that's the case, there's always going to be demand. And so long as there's always demand, there's invariably going to be somebody who provides the supply, in this case, in the form of decentralized finance. You know, I think the real question as far as to how much this succeeds is going to be what merchants do. Uh, you know, institutional investors like major retailers, wholesalers, finance companies, banks, what have you. Uh, you know, the kinds of institutions that are responsible for most of the flow of money around the world and that kind of back or are responsible for most economic activity to one degree or another. Um, if they get involved with decentralized finance because they see it as safer or more efficient or more profitable 
then yeah, in that case, it's definitely going to happen and there's going to be almost nothing anybody can do to stop it. But it just kind of depends on how safe it can be and how secure it can be and whatnot. And yeah, I'm not sufficiently technically minded on the subject to be able to comment on that. I did see some stuff about the president or prime minister of El Salvador. He's like a <laughs> he's like a full on crypto bro of like he's one with the gospel and this is the new way of the future and everyone should have crypto. We're gonna make a crypto city and we're gonna have crypto underwear. It's like everything crypto. And, kind uh, of. Yeah, I'm embellishing it a little bit, but he's very enthused about it. And there are some people who really are, and they believe that that is now the future of what money is going to be. Yeah. Well, well you're see. right to embellish because he himself has embellished it. <laughs> but that's the correct characterization. Uh, my issue is more with the fact that I suspect, I can't prove it, but I kind of suspect that he's actually not as interested in crypto chain and crypto currencies as he is in trying to make money for his patronage network. Because, hmm. uh, you know, it's all good and well to announce that, hey, cryptocurrencies are, you know, officially uh, legal, you know, legal tender within El Salvador. Uh, the problem lay more with the payment processing app that was created in order to actually operationalize uh, trade using the cryptocurrency in question. Uh, guess who designed and owns that payment processing app? Someone he's involved with in some way? His brother. Oh. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Pretty close to home there. Yeah, it wasn't subtle. And, you know, that's the kind of sort of borderline corruption nepotism that's not uncommon in a lot of central american countries if not you know latin american countries in general and you know we have it here in the u.s too but you know the elites in latin america are particularly bold in doing things like that so that's kind of my suspicion as to what's really going on in el salvador you know i'm sure there's merits to cryptocurrency being legal tender and for there being a national payment processing app that can help facilitate its usage but also, at the same time, political culture in places like El Salvador is not perhaps the most clean cut. You know, it's there's a fair amount of corruption and political elites never waste any major opportunity to kind of take advantage of uh, potential, you know, ways to make money like this. So given the uh, article that I read on the subject and given some of the uh, conflicts of interest inherent and in who's running the payment processing app and uh, who profits from it and whatnot. I kind of suspect that the whole cryptocurrency thing was probably more about making money on the part of his family than it was about trying to do something really cool and revolutionary uh, for the El Salvadoran economy. But he wears his hat sideways. Like, he's got to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a cool guy. He's actually really young. I think he's about our age. You know, I also read something interesting, and I guess this is kind of neither here nor there, but... uh. Apparently, a lot of the political elites in Central America are actually Arab, which I had not been aware of. Hmm. Uh, apparently, they kind of came in in the past couple decades and uh, rose to prominence in the economy. They were originally like uh, economic elites. You know, they made they migrated as refugees or what have you, and then made investments, and then eventually became very wealthy. And then, of course, in Latin America, you know, becoming wealthy inherently pretty much means you become politically influential. And as a result, uh, a lot of these refugee Arab families uh, that emerged as major players in Central America are now major political figures, which is why uh, the president of El Salvador has such a kind of funky sounding name. Like his name is Bukele, Bukele. It's not a Spanish sounding name, basically, is what I'm getting at. You know, I, the first time I read it, I thought, you know, that can't be Spanish. And uh, it's actually not. He, he was, uh, his family anyway, was originally from Lebanon. And apparently that's not an unusual uh, location. You know, the Levant, I should say more broadly, is not an unusual uh, point of origin for a lot of the new economic elites in uh, Central America. But yeah, cryptocurrency is kind of in the ascendancy right now, but kind of like what I said a couple weeks ago, 
I don't know that the blockchain technology or you know cryptocurrency in general is going to be what people should pay the most attention to, because the technology is kind of set. You know, it's been pretty much proven at this point. I think what people should focus more on are the payment processing applications that are being developed, because those are kind of where, you know, like I just illustrated with the El Salvador example, that's kind of where the corruption can happen. That's where the conflicts of interest can happen. And that's also where technical issues can happen. You know, if somebody wants to steal from your wallet, so to speak, uh, that's where you would do it. You know, you would kind of probably you would do it through the payment processing application through which you interact with the currency that you own. So definitely keep your eye on that ball uh, as cryptocurrency and decentralized finance continues to evolve. But yeah, I wouldn't add too much more beyond that. I'm not a finance guy per se. <clears throat> I'm a trained economist, technically, but I'm not a financier. Two different academic areas of study. Have you heard about NFTs? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> yes i've heard of nfts it's amazing those, those really took off yeah like it became weirdly popular if you think about it it hits basically the same button as trading cards i think because it's about showing it to other people and that's the excitement and a trading card it's not like a game that you play like when you're looking at it it's just an item but it's a it hits the collector button for people and you can kind of talk about it and fancy yourself like a connoisseur of these things that represent something else that don't really have too much inherent value aside from what other people decide it's worth and the value can get pretty crazy overall i think people are either really into it and think that it's really cool or they think it's like really dumb. And they're like, why would you spend money on this? It makes no sense at all. Yeah. yeah, I think there is potential there as far as things like intellectual property. You know, you could use that as a new approach to establishing ownership over intangible goods and properties of that kind, but I don't know that it's so much more attractive than the current system as to be able to supplant it. So I'm a little skeptical about the little mini boom that's been going on. <clears throat> Let's see. So the next question was, do I have any thoughts on the Schlieffen plan? See, this is a history nerds question right here. <laughs> what What is the Schlieffen plan? Oh, the Schlieffen plan was the German plan for World War I that they had set up before World War I. Hmm. Yeah, so the question here was, I had heard initially that it was the plan leading into the First World War, but then later turned out to be false. Not sure what the case is, what, what the case it as it is debated. Uh, well, that was my impression too. I, my understanding is that the Schlieffen plan was the plan drawn up by Germany in the late 1800s uh, for how to deal with a two-front war between Russia and France. But uh, perhaps I'm not sufficiently familiar with the subject to be aware of the nuances. But yeah, you know, from what I'd read, that was the case. The Schlieffen plan was basically that in the event of a two-front war, which, mind you, the German leadership did not expect to be able to win, uh, the plan would be to focus most, if not all, of the German army on the French border and then invade France and knock it out of the war very quickly and early and then to shift the army back to the Eastern Front where they would then fight a climactic battle with the Russian army. Mind you, at this period, in this period of history in the late 1800s, the Russian army was thought to be one of, if not the most powerful in Europe. Uh, you know, this is kind of before warfare became super industrialized and mechanized uh, as was seen in World War I. You know, people didn't really know what a modern industrial war would look like. So at the time, people were still kind of thinking in terms of raw manpower. You know, if you had the bigger army, you were more likely to win. That didn't mean you would always win, but uh, certainly it had probably, it was probably the single most important factor. And uh, yeah, that being the case, the Russians obviously being the most populous nation in Europe had the inside track as far as to who could field the largest armies. So the Germans were very afraid of that, you know, sufficiently disconcerted that, uh, they drew up this plan and that would allow them to focus their entire military might on dealing with the Russians. But it all hinged on being able to knock France out of the war early 
and also being able to kind of slow down the Russian advance in the east long enough uh, for the Western operations to conclude. So that was my impression anyway of the Schlieffen plan, but maybe this guy has heard something different. Obviously the Schlieffen plan did not work out particularly well. <laughs> World War I saw the plan more or less implemented and uh, yeah, they didn't knock France out of the war quickly, to put it mildly. But they did shock everybody by mangling the Russians. You know, to be fair, the Russians had a hard time in the war, partly just for logistical issues and because some of their officers were dipshits. Two of the generals that were, I think we might have, might have talked about this even a couple weeks ago, but two of the generals that were leading the Russian invasion of Eastern Germany at the outset of the war were rivals, you know, and they kind of assumed implicitly that they would steamroll the German army in Prussia, you know, in Eastern Germany. And so they kind of spent more time competing with each other and trying to sabotage each other than they did on actually trying to win the war. You know, maybe if they had done otherwise, things would have turned out different. But as was, the Germans were able to defeat them at uh, the Battle of Tannenberg, I believe was the first major victory. And then I think there was also another one at Masurian Lakes. But maybe that was a different battle. I could be mis misremembering. This description makes me think very vividly about having guildmates for WoW fight on Discord. <laughs> which causes people to be less effective because they don't get along yeah well officer vanity is a real thing and it's not been uncommon throughout military history some guys are just more focused on the uh, glamour if you like of being a major military figure well it's less rather... about the result of how can we get this done efficiently and well and it's how can I look good yeah unfortunately so some of them pull it off. Some of them can kind of do both, be a good general and be an attention whore. <laughs> but a lot of them don't. Yeah. What was I talking about? The Schlieven plan. Schlieven plan, there we go, okay. okay. Yeah, so the Schlieffen plan, knock France out early, focus on Russia, ended up kind of going haywire when they got hung up on the Western Front and ended up being surprisingly successful against the Russians. You know, superior technology, superior tactics, better strategy, better logistics, better leaders, you know, a whole raft of major factors were definitely in favor of the Germans at the time. And so they were able to surprise everybody and kind of beat back the Russians. And not only that, but start to push into Russian territory. Yeah, the history of the Eastern Front in World War I is not super well taught, I feel. I myself have gone out of my way to study the Eastern Front in World War II, but even I haven't really focused much on the Eastern Front in World War I. So I think that would be an interesting subject of study at some point. But yeah, Schlieffen plan. I guess I kind of answered the question. That was My understanding is that the uh, questioner here is right, that that is a correct characterization of the plan. <clears throat> but I welcome correction if not. Let's see, Mass Neotech, what in the, what is the PMF in Iraq and how is Iraq handling itself in comparison to Afghanistan after the exit of US forces? Saw this tweet earlier that made me think about it. Let me see. I'm looking at the tweet here. <laughs> PMF. What was the PMF? Popular Mobilization Forces. Is that what that? I'm going to do a quick fact check on that because I don't want to. I don't want to bullshit anybody. Popular Mobilization Forces. Okay, I was right. Okay, so 2015, maybe, uh, actually maybe it was 2014. Well, do you remember the Islamic State Neuro? Yep. Yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty high profile. right into group. that power vacuum <laughs> yeah. where no one actually was. Yeah, they took over a good chunk of Eastern Syria and Northern Iraq. And everybody was all panicked about it, especially in Iraq for obvious reasons. And the Iraqi military had basically melted away, you know, in so much as they were there at all, you know, they just kind of ran. So that being the case, 
there was a question of how to stop Islamic State. And they were moving pretty quickly, so there was like real concern on the part of people in southern Iraq as to what to do. So what happened is that people in southern Iraq, which to remind the listener is disproportionately the Shiite portion of Iraq, Shiite being a denomination of Islam, basically, you know, one of the uh, one of the two major ones, as I understand it, which is in direct opposition to uh, the style of Islam favored by Islamic State. You know, being extremists, the Islamic State saw Shiites as basically no different than apostates and believed that they should be killed or converted. So not the kind of people you want invading your neighborhood, basically. So the Shiites of the southern part of Iraq mobilized militia units in order to try to in order to defend their communities from Islamic State in lieu of a substantive defense provided by the Iraqi army. And these were called the popular mobilization units or popular popular mobilization forces, rather. I always want to call them units for some reason. So a lot of these were not really militias created on the fly, you know, like they're sometimes portrayed. A lot of them were actually pre-existing militias that had already been around and fighting for a while, usually with other militias, sometimes with uh, Al-Qaeda, sometimes with the Iraqi Sunni nationalist militiamen, sometimes with Sunni tribesmen, and sometimes with other Shi'i militias. You know, the Iraq war and the whole clusterfuck of the Iraqi civil war that happened within it is a whole other topic of conversation. But basically, a lot of these militias actually originated in the fighting from that period of time. And they were still around when the Islamic State started to invade uh, northern Iraq. So when there was a call to try to deploy militias to defend communities, a lot of these militias uh, were the first to come up and they took on the moniker popular mobilization forces basically to kind of grant them a degree of legitimacy. Mind you, they did not name themselves that, rather the government did, in order to give a kind of legal veneer, you know, a, le a degree of legal legitimacy to these militias uh, so that they could kind of justify supporting them and interacting with them in the defense of uh, Iraq from the Islamic State. So the popular mobilization forces were disproportionately Shi'i for one, like I said, but they were also disproportionately populated by militias that had been supported and funded, if not also supplied by the Iranian government. Mind you, the Iranian government had been meddling in Iraq for years, you know, going all the way back to when they were supporting uh, militias, specifically nationalist Shi'i militias in the south of Iraq against the United States. You know, there were a variety of insurgent groups in Iraq. Some of them were Shi'i in nature, and those were generally supported by the Iranian military, specifically Qassam Soleimani, and the Quds Force, which is basically Iran's special forces unit. So they were pretty well armed and they had a uh, pretty strong ties to Iran. And as such, they tended to kind of take the lead amongst the uh, popular mobilization forces as the, as sort of the vanguard of the defense of Iraq. And uh, as it happened, you know, the uh, Islamic State never penetrated into really southern Iraq or to Baghdad. Uh, you know, kind of like what Nuro was saying before, all of the areas they went into were areas where that were weakly held by the Iraqi army or, you know, maybe weren't even held at all and which were generally pretty receptive uh, to an invasion by an insurgent force because, you know, the government was pretty unpopular in a lot of those places. So they just kind of moved into a vacuum uh, and took over. But the same factors that made it easy to conquer northern Iraq did not exist in southern Iraq. In southern Iraq, there was nobody who wanted them to be there. Uh, and there was also a much stronger presence of militias and whatnot, and also a stronger army presence in the south. So it was never realistic for the Islamic State to expect to be able to take it. But that didn't mean people were not afraid that the Islamic State wasn't going to try. And so that led to the mobilization of these uh, militias. So I'm... Um, I guess I'm kind of belaboring the point of, at this juncture, but you get the idea. So uh, I guess to kind of cap that off though, the point I would, the last point I would want to make is that the popular mobilization forces are not just militias that popped up in response to Islamic State. A lot of them are actually proxies for Iran. You know, the Iranian military continues to have ties for them and uh, they've continued to kind of do the Iranian, well, not do their bidding per se, you know, Basically, they have some things in common. You know, obviously, the militia leaders want power, and so they work together with the Iranians to pursue common interests. And, uh, of course, getting the United States out of Iraq and competing with other 
more pro-Western political forces in Iraq are part of that. So generally when you hear about political violence in Iraq, like protesters being killed or people really pushing hard to get the United States out of Iraq in one capacity or another, generally those are political groups associated with the popular mobilization forces. Uh, I guess I should add here that the popular mobilization forces became somewhat popular for their defense of Iraq against the Islamic State and founded a bunch of political parties in order to channel that popularity into political power. So they were able to pick up a pretty significant number of seats in the election, uh, I want to say 2017, 2018, whenever it was. And they've been pretty significant political players since then, but more recently they've lost a lot of seats because they are seen now more broadly by the Iraqi body politic as being proxies for a foreign power, that being Iran. Uh, that hasn't stopped them from murdering dissidents and murdering protesters, but that's kind of just underlying the criticism. So not doing themselves a lot of favors at this point. So to a degree, you could say Iraqi politics right now is a competition between violent Iranian-backed militias and with the nascent civil society that is kind of trying to emerge, uh, but is having trouble because it's partly being channeled by sort of vested interests in the country some of which are pro-American, but most of which are more nationalist in orientation. Uh, there's a guy, a cleric named Muqtada al-Sadr, um, who is the son of a very well-regarded and well-revered religious leader who was uh, murdered by Saddam Hussein in the 1970s. And uh, he channeled his father's popularity into a pretty significant nationalist insurgents group in southern Iraq. Uh, what was it? It was the Mahdi Army, I think it was, you know, Jaish something or other. I'm sure people who fought in Iraq would know it right away. Uh, they were very, you know, well known. But uh, he ended up running off to Iran for a while to focus on religious studies because he was afraid that his movement was becoming too hijacked uh, by Iranian backed militias of one kind or another. And so he tried to separate his militias into ones that were loyal to him and ones that were more loyal to Quds Force. And uh, that kind of repaired his image somewhat in Iraq. So, so, to the degree that he was able to run as a nationalist politician and is now one of the leading nationalist politicians in Iraq next to some of the other Sunni politicians. Doesn't mean he's pro-American per se, just that he doesn't like foreign interference in general. But Iraqi politics is also a little bit opaque at the elite level, so you know who's to say what his game is over the long run. But in general, he's more nationalist. And uh, some of his guys, some of his militias were also part of the popular mobilization force of forces, but he broke away from them uh, after Islamic State was defeated. And since then, he's been kind of running as a separate group. This is kind of devolving into a description of Iraqi politics, which isn't really the crux of the question. But basically, that's what the PF, PMF is. You know, Originally, they were militias. Now they're kind of a political force trying to capitalize on their achievements as militias in the war against Islamic State. And more recently, they've become more discredited due to their ties to Iran. So that's the first part of the question. Second part of the question, how is Iraq handling itself in comparison to Afghanistan after the exit of US forces? US forces have not fully exited Iran, Iraq, rather. Um, technically, you know, formal combat troops, you know, uh, air assets, whatnot, those have left. But the United States retains a relationship with the Iraqi military in the form of uh, advisors, training, some logistical support, and probably a significant amount of intelligence sharing. So the United States has technically officially pulled out of Iraq, but in reality, the U.S. still has an informal military presence on the ground, uh, which is what a lot of the uh, militia groups aligned with Iran don't like. You know. Whenever you hear about uh, an Iraqi air base being attacked by a rocket, generally you'll hear that in reference to a militia group trying to kill Americans on the base, or at least to send a signal to the Iraqi government that it doesn't like that there are American advisors on the base. And that's kind of turned into a proxy battle between Iran and the United States as far as battling for influence in Iraq. Uh, the United States has its influence mostly in the form of advisors and elite level connections. Uh, Iran's influence is more at the level of certain militias and political groups. So it's not quite accurate to say the U.S. has pulled out. Um, as far as how Iraq has done since the U.S. quote-unquote technically pulled out, um, they've done better than Afghanistan in general, but that's a very low bar. <laughs> <laughs> Afghanistan 
was not particularly well developed to begin with. And even after, you know, 20 years of uh, investment from major foreign powers, uh, you know, progress was made, but it wasn't like on a level of some of the surrounding states yet. So Iraq, in contrast, had been much more built up over the course of, you know, the 1970s and 60s, you know, sort of that more golden era of a post-war Middle East, of the post-war Middle East. Uh, obviously, the Iran-Iraq War in the 80s kind of did some damage, and then the, the sanctions regime in the 90s did damage, and then the Iraq War in the aughts did some damage as well. So that's kind of 30 straight years of damage there, but that doesn't change the fact that Iraq, before that sort of deluge of terrible events, had urbanized and developed much more than Afghanistan had. Also keep in mind that Iraq has the benefit slash curse of oil revenue. So they had a lot more money and have had a lot more money to work with than the Afghan government ever did. Uh, the trouble, of course, is that having a lot of easy money in that way which kind of lends itself to corruption. So, you know, great temptation and whatnot. And uh, a lot of successive Iraqi governments have been unable uh, to resist the temptation of using that oil money um, to either set up a totalitarian one-party state, in the case of Saddam Hussein, uh, or in somewhat less radical later governments to set up extensive patronage networks that focus on divvying up resources extracted from the government rather than actually focusing on good public policy uh, to the predictable detriment of public policy. So in general, Iraq was in a better position before the deluge, hasn't been doing great since then, but doing better than Afghanistan still. Uh, you know, Baghdad is still a relatively modern city, comparatively speaking, and they've got some other areas like Basra and uh, Erbil. Erbil, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, that are also relatively well off, comparatively speaking. You know, not, not European levels of well off, but relatively well off. Although maybe Kurdistan comes close. They've been pretty peaceful and stable for the past couple decades. But yeah, Baghdad, Basra, those are examples of you know relatively built up urban areas. And also the population is super concentrated along the Tigris and Euphrates. So there's, there's a number of urban areas around in those areas as well that people are kind of concentrated in. Yeah, the economy has done better, but it's still overly dependent on oil and political corruption means that that oil money is not invested very productively, you know, like it should be, which is one of the reasons there's been mass protests in Iraq. Politically speaking, it's still kind of messy. You know, like I mentioned before, there's, you know, violent militias that just kind of roam around and do what they want in a lot of areas. But they've been making some progress on that. You know, the new government under uh, Prime Minister Kadimi has been trying, you know, intermittently to focus on establishing the uh, government's monopoly on violence, so to speak, to establish that, to disarm militias and to have the Iraqi police and security forces as the only substantive armed force in the country. So he's been trying to arrest and uh, convict leaders of these sort of violent groups that use violence to maintain their political power. Uh, progress has been a little bit mixed. You know, the militias are very powerful and the Iraqi government is comparatively weak. So it's kind of hard for them to make progress on that front. But Kadimi is uh, notable for at least making a sustained effort, whereas others preferred to just cut deals with this, that or the other group. So much more progress in terms of uh, creating a single respected state authority. I guess to a degree you could say they've done that by making a desert and calling it peace. Uh, one of the sig significant centers of opposition to the Iraqi government as created after the US invasion was in the Sunni areas, sort of in the middle of the country. And uh, the Iraqi government was never able to really appease them to the point where they felt sufficiently respected and invested in the Iraqi government that they were willing to accept its writ. Uh, obviously, them siding with the Islamic State invasion in 2014 is the obvious manifestation of that mistrust. But uh, since then, the Iraqi government, as well as its militias, have moved back in and reconquered that territory. And they were not always very nice to the inhabitants when they were doing so. So the result is that the Sunni population in the middle of Iraq has been somewhat conquered and subjugated at this point. Uh, so their resistance to the Iraqi government is somewhat of a moot point as a result. So that's not really a major threat to the Iraqi government at this juncture. Uh, more of the threat comes from competition, proxy competition between Iran and the United States. 
There could be a threat from Kurdish separatism, but I suspect they've got that under control at this point. There's kind of a trifecta of power in Iraq between uh, the Turkish government, uh, the Baghdad government, and then one of the two major Kurdish political parties. I don't know if I can remember which one it was. I want to say it was Puk, P-U-K. The other one was the KDF, I think. So the KDF, I th again, I might, I could well be getting this wrong. I don't quite remember which was it, which was which. But I want to say the KDF was relatively more pro-Iranian, whereas the PUK was more pro-Turkish. And so the PUK is kind of the one in charge right now in a lot of the Kurdish territories. So they've been working with Baghdad and Turkey in order to kind of keep things quiet and you know basically continue making money. There's a fair amount of oil up in that area, so they have good incentive to keep things quiet. So that particular area of Iraq is doing okay. But the rest of it is just kind of roiling. You know, everybody, basically, you can say that uh, the story of modern Iraq is the story of trying to form a new state after, in the wake of the US invasion in 2003. That's very much kind of been the common theme through the past, you know, 20 some years. So that's uh, very much still a process kind of evolving right now. Um, it looks really bad. <laughs> So I can't really blame people for not being impressed with it. But I think it's remarkable to note, well, maybe not remarkable per se, but it's notable uh, that the experiment has not just been outright abandoned. You know, it would have been probably much easier by this point to have had a strong man just seize power and establish a dictatorship and try to impose uh, order by force, basically. So the fact that that has not happened lends uh, some credit you know, to the body politic of Iraq and their desire to try at least to make a democratic Republican society work. Democrat, that was kind of redundant. To make the Iraqi Republic work, that's what I meant. So hopefully that experiment can reach a successful conclusion sooner rather than later. Um, you know, it's kind of an interesting experiment if you ignore the uh, context, context in which it originated. So best of luck to them. But uh, yeah, that's just kind of, that's, a rough summary of where Iraq is after the U.S. pullout, such as I can remember it. It's just still violent and unstable, but kind of trending better in general. We've got a couple more here, but I don't know if you're... Oh, you're in game. Yeah, I'm in a game if you want to knock them out. You may do so, Sam. Let's see. Do you ever think cryptocurrency will eventually be regulated? Yes, it's all it's already being regulated. Um, just not so much in the United States. You know, China's outright banned it. Uh, India, I think, significantly restricted access to it, or maybe maybe they banned it too. I don't quite remember. And then Europe is always regulating things, so you know, I'm sure they, I'm sure they've got some new rule on it somewhere uh, in the European Commission. But yeah, there's definitely been a general shift towards regulating cryptocurrencies and digital currencies and whatnot. Yeah, that's already happening. But as whether or not as to whether or not the United States will do it, I don't know. Uh, we'll see what happens. It could be if there's, a, you know, one of the things that happened after China banned cryptocurrency, which included a ban on crypto mining, mind you, is that a lot of Chinese crypto miners actually moved to Texas. Uh, the idea being that electricity was relatively cheap here and that there weren't any restrictions on crypto mining. So this was somewhat alarming to some people, given that uh, electricity shortages were one of the problems that Texas faced in the big freeze last year. So there was some concern maybe crypto miners would eat up so much electricity that if there were another big freeze, uh, then you know, the whole grid might fail. But I don't think anything's come of that fear as of yet. So we'll see. But yeah, it's a relatively unregulated market such that we can attract crypto miners like that. And that unless there's something major that happens, you know, maybe like a major electrical grid failure, I don't foresee significant regulation pending as of yet. You know, I think it's more likely they would regulate it if there was some kind of major financial crisis. You know, in that case, uh, crypto may act as a, uh, it may act to exacerbate whatever financial problem is uh, occurring. So in that case, there may be some emergency restrictions of some kind placed on cryptocurrency. 
Uh, I don't even know how that would work at a technical level, because I know the whole point is that it's decentralized. Uh, but there may at least be an attempt to regulate it anyway, under such circumstances. But yeah, it's... I guess the answer is that in the context of the United States, it depends. It's going to depend on circumstances more than anything. But for now, in the short term, I don't really foresee much regulation coming. And let's see. The next question was, have you read about the illegal espionage in Argentina? If not, I can send you an email with news about it. Uh, yeah, send me the email because I haven't heard about that. And that's news to me. I can't imagine what it would be. I think this was mentioned to be in chat during the week. Oh, really? A brief summary, yes. If you're in chat, I think it's Dagnip who gave the question. You could give us a, a short version before he gets the email and so on. But there is apparently some recording of some person who's in a pretty high position in politics now and the evidence is not too bueno. Well, is that espionage or is that just corruption? Uh, that's a good question. Because if it's espionage, that kind of implies that a foreign power was involved somehow. And that's kind of what would confuse me, because I don't know who would even really want to interfere that much in Argentina. The U.S.? The U.S.? Oh, we don't care. <laughs> We've interfered with lots of people. Why are we not interfere with them? You know, the, the way that we interfered in Argentina was to help them better be more proficient in murdering their people. Mm. But the murder of their people in the first place was very much their idea. We didn't have to plant that. Argentine politics has plenty of discord in it without the CIA's help. We were just a force multiplier more than anything. And I would point out that the United States has Argentina as a major non-NATO ally, which is not a short list. Well, it, it is a short list, rather. Not every country gets on that list. So that kind of illustrates how close the United States and Argentina are generally. Yeah, there's been a little bit of uncertainty regarding the Kirchners and that whole regime. But in general, I don't think there's like any real tension between the United States and Argentina. And there's no expectation on the part of the United States, strategically speaking, that Argentina is going to be some kind of threat unto itself or that it's going to ally with foreign powers or whatnot. So, you know, without any kind of substantive impetus that I can see, I don't know why the CIA would be interested in Argentina at this point. So that's why I'm a little skeptical then that it would be the U.S. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they've got something that I missed. It was the AFI spying on members of the government. The AFI. Yeah, I don't know what the AFI is. The American Film Institute. <laughs> no, I don't think that's it. Uh, let's see. Federal. Oh, that's like their FBI. Oh, no, never mind. Their principal intelligence agency. Okay, so that's more like their CIA, maybe? Well, in the United States, it's a little weird because we have uh, a whole bunch of intelligence agencies. So the CIA is responsible for activity outside the United States. And the FBI is responsible for activity inside the United States. So we don't have a single intelligence agency per se. But I understand that some countries do. So I guess this is one of them. So let's see. So then this intelligence agency was spying on leading politicians. And just trying to dig up dirt on them? Or were they uh, doing it on be at somebody's behest? Because they would need to be doing it on some other government's behest for it to count as espionage, right? Yeah, yeah. That's kind of what I'm thinking. Hmm. Yeah, I think I remember reading a similar story like this. Or maybe it was this story. Nah, it's been too long. Yeah, there was an intelligence... No, South Korea, that's what it was. 
South Korea's intelligence agency got in trouble because they were collecting information about uh, left-wing politicians. And there was a big giant kerfuffle over it in Korean politics. This was a couple of years ago, I think. Yeah, so I think that's the case I'm remembering. So I'm not sure about this one. But yeah, I'd be, you know, grateful to receive uh, information on it. You know, if you've got any links or anything. I think my email is down there somewhere. Uh, what was it? John TX1848 at gmail.com. Yeah, if you use the who is it command, it's linked in there. Who is that man talking on the stream? Why is oh, he so oh, silent? Is it a podcast? Oh. My allergies are starting to kick up. <clears throat> Let's see. All right, so there's that. The next question was, do you think that the US monetary policies will cause the dollar to crash? And if it does, do you think it will lead to a war with other power nations? No, I don't think so as of now, anyway. I think... Uh, you know, there's obviously been an immense amount of monetary expansion. Uh, but I guess two things to keep in mind. One, the U.S. economy is just really massive and it has an immense capacity to absorb uh, demand. You know, there's the whole mystery about missing inflation, for example. So that kind of plays into it. I know some people will say, well, you know, the inflation is there. It's just that it's focused on fixed assets like, you know, houses and stuff like that. But that still doesn't explain... Uh, why there's why there was not any way a significant increase in the uh, consumer price index you know there should have been technically you know according to uh, orthodox theory but it kind of didn't really happen after 2008 anyway and we've only really started to see it now but even now it's not entirely clear cut because we've got so many uh, negative externalities as far as supply disruptions that it's kind of hard to tell the difference between uh, demand-driven inflation and supply-restricted inflation. So, tricky business. <clears throat> but yeah, that's one reason that I'm not too worried about it. And then another reason uh, is that the United States is not the only uh, economy that has seen a significant increase in money supply. Uh, you know, pretty much everybody, you know, every, every country around the world responded to COVID-19 with a uh, loose monetary policy. And so because everybody did it at the same time, it's kind of hard to see who basically would, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to see the United States losing ground to other countries given that they did the same thing. Uh, that's not to say that there might not be a problem. You know, there could have been a bubble inflated somewhere that could crash or, you know, who knows? You know, the economy is so complex now, it can be hard to kind of figure out all the interrelationships necessary to understand what's going to happen. Uh, but, you know, that said, in general, I don't think the U.S. dollar is going to depreciate so much in response to uh, the current monetary policy relative to other currencies, specifically because those other currencies underwent the same treatment, basically. Now, it could be, and there's an argument to be made here, that uh, there's a global liquidity glut, not just the United States, but the entire planet, and that there's just way too much currency rolling around right now, and that there could be a kind of global shift away from currency because it's seen as being devalued and towards things like gold or other commodities. So if there were a crash, I suspect it would probably look more like that. So I don't expect that to be a problem, per se. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's anybody's guess as to whether or not it could actually become a problem, but at least for now, I haven't heard anybody seriously predicting that. So for the moment, anyway, I'm not too worried about it. Yeah, there's always the usual ebb and flow of value going up, value going down, demand going up, demand going down, periods of stability and instability. We'll probably have another period like the 90s at some point in the future once we figure out this new format of existence where more people are working from home and things are getting more technological. 
people. You've got some growing pains for now. Optimist. <laughs> I'm, I am an optimist. I believe that good people win the long game. I think a lot of what constitutes uh, evil action and selfish action is very short-term thinking. We will out-endure them. That is my plan. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, you did a nice three hours 15 today. Agent Smith with the carry. We hit Russia. Talked about some regions. If there are any Russian viewers from the YouTube video or in the chat now, feel free to give some comments on your perspectives. We were just talking about some of the different regions because we're both from the United States and anyone who's from a different country is generally going to have a, a more narrow view of a country. And a country as large as Russia has a lot of different regions that are pretty distinct and unique and interesting in their own way. So if you have anything to share about that, feel free. Talked a good bit about uh, French Canada, Quebec, and the Quebecois. Hit South America a bit, Eastern Europe. Talked about French influence. We've been around today. Well, there was one more question, but I don't know if we have time for it. Is it a big one? Let's see. Would you be able to give a general overview of the current state of the European Union? <laughs> Where it looks like it's heading. <laughs> That's a moment. big one. Yeah. Yeah, that might take a little bit of time. We might save that for next time. Agent Smith, do you have a Brexit update for us? <laughs> Can you give a general overview of Brexit? Oh, boy. Whenever you said referendum was 52%, I immediately thought yeah. Brexit. <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of the uh, go-to example for me as far as badly planned referendums. Yep. Certainly a consequential one. Don't worry, Zormito. I'm going to upload this right away, post-haste. Agent Smith, thank you so much for coming on. Moss Neotech, thank you for stepping up and handling questions. And thank you, chat, for helping us out with them. If you have any corrections of what we talked about or suggestions of topics for next time, feel free to share in the comments as this is an active dialogue. And if we are wrong, please help us. We don't want to be spewing misinformation. That's nasty. <laughs> a happy new year, though. I've been thinking about yep. 2022, and I've been telling people that I think that we can just punch this year in the face. Because <laughs> last time, we went into 2021, like, hoping that it was going to be a good year. I don't think that worked. I think we should, <laughs> we should expect it to be bad and just to be prepared to just punch right through it. That's my mindset. Strong opener. Yes. There you go. Just Agent establish Smith. Establish dominance. Agent Smith is about to drop kick the challenges that face him this year. I'm oh, stoked. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I have the uh, lower body strength to do a jump kick. <laughs> if you keep doing your regular walk, you will. There you go. Yep. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, it's a privilege as always much appreciated. it's good talking to you again and uh happy new year sir hell yeah happy new year and we will see you on the next episode of world discussion with agent smith smith yeah. see you next time smith smith thanks agent smith chat y'all have been very enthusiastic about him it's pretty cool the the way that his name has expanded and grown on twitch to where I got asked, we hit a milestone this week. I know a lot of people will like, they'll post a tweet of like, I got this many followers, whatever. There was a personal milestone for me in being critically annoyed at being asked when he's gonna be on next. <laughs> when is Adrian Smith? When is Adrian Smith? When is Adrian Smith? Command add, Agent Smith win. Agent Smith is generally on at 6 p.m. Pacific time on Sundays. We're pretty, consistent around that time frame. Sometimes we start at 5.30, sometimes it's at 6.30, but we usually start around then and we usually go for about three hours. So if you wanna catch us live, you can do that. If you have any questions, but you can't catch us live, say it's the middle of the night for you, you can leave a YouTube comment because he does look at those. So fire away with your questions because I think a big part of the content that happens on this segment is just what people want to ask him. So thank you very much, Agent Smith and Chat, for helping us put on a consistent and awesome segment. We haven't kept count of how many Agent Smiths we've done, but this has been running for years, and that's badass.
big ups here. And we will see you on the next one. GG.